Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Karen is furious that she can't use our restroom. I work in a pet supply store in a large strip mall type area. For safety issues, our restrooms are for employee use only, locked with a keypad. This change happened the first week I started working there, so I never really asked any questions about it. We are literally a 30 second walk to several other stores that do have public restrooms. Me. Hi, is there anything you need help with? Customer. I have been driving all day and I really need to use the restroom. She put extra emphasis on the all day part and I could tell that she already knew our restrooms are not public but she was trying to make me feel bad for her. Me. Oh, I'm sorry. We don't have public restrooms. But, insert closest store name, right next door does. Awkward silence for a moment. Me. Is there anything else I can help you with? Karen. Where's the cat food? Me. The next few aisles in that direction are all cat food. The next half hour includes her grabbing a single bag of cat food and then proceeding to walk around and have the exact same conversation with all of my coworkers. Every single one. She's yelling about how she's been driving all day and needs a restroom immediately. Interesting. You could have gone 20 minutes ago to the one next door. She comes back to the aisle I'm working on and meanders around a bit. Me. Is there something else I can help you with? Karen. What I need help with is that I've been driving all day to get stuff from your store and I just need to use the restroom. She had a very common brand of cat food in her hand that she could have found in most grocery stores. Me. I'm so sorry. There's nothing I can do about that. She storms off yelling over the fact that she's spending money so she should get to use our restroom. She's not the first one that's angry either. Common responses I get include, seriously? Are you kidding me? Or the classic eye roll. This happens at least twice a week. What's so special about our specific restroom that makes you need to use it? I'm just following the rules. I'd literally get in trouble if I let you use the restroom. You wanna be kept up to date on your son's behavior? No problem. I teach, have done so for the past 13 years now. Most parents are just fine. They care for and love their kids and treat me and my colleagues with respect. You have the occasional parent you don't see because they don't care, the helicopter or curling parent, and the parent who doesn't believe they're raising evil offspring. The latter is the one I had the misfortune of dealing with for two years. I was mentor of 20 kids in the first two years of secondary school. It has its ups and downs, with the biggest up that you knew every fiber of every kid and two years of relative heck if you had kids who were a nightmare. Kid started secondary school with me as a mentor. He started out alright. There were some minor things that were normal for teenagers trying to fit in. It all started after the Christmas holidays of that first year. Nothing special happened, it's like a switch just flipped inside this kid. Bullying classmates and other students, pushing around being extremely disruptive in class, cursing at the teachers, grabbing things up to the point we suspected he stole things from teachers and students alike, but lack of security cameras were a problem. Mom and dad were invited many times, school counselor and my boss sat in on many of these conversations. Mother denied that her son didn't do such things. We didn't get any further, but had no grounds on expelling the son. Summer break came, and due to the fact that a lot of things went missing, cameras were set up. Classes started in year two, and first day he let me know he was there and had changed. For the worse. We had five calls with mom in that first week alone. Mom was invited once more, and then she was surprised that I was the only teacher complaining. Like, what the heck, lady? Did you not listen that multiple teachers complained through me, and that I told you multiple times what they said to you? No, no, no. She demanded that she got a call or email from the teachers herself if her son did do anything. And I quote, But I highly doubt that since I know my son wouldn't ever do the things you said. Fuming at this point, I said I would talk to my colleagues. 
Cue the malicious compliance. Mommy wanted a call or email from the teacher who saw her son doing or saying things he shouldn't? You ask, and we get it. Kid was being such a jerk by now, he was well known throughout the whole school. So in the next school-wide meeting, I told her demand. Some frowns here and there, but then I saw it. Eyes glistening. Evil grins started to come along with the evil laughter of teachers. By this time, the kid had set a record in the digital student entry system, 20 entries a day from him alone. It all started the next day. Kid came onto school property, walked up to a classmate, and started insulting him and his mother who was sick. Two teachers heard and saw him do that, so two teachers sent an email to Mommy Dearest. Three periods of lessons with a variety of terrible behavior. Three emails were sent yet again. During first break, Kit threw a bin through the canteen. Three teachers and the custodian saw it. Four emails about that. Then the custodian emailed again, telling her that he refused to clean up after him and threw a chair before leaving. Another five periods for that day with six teachers. Science had two teachers. So, you guessed it, six emails and three phone calls to Mommy Dearest. So on average, Mommy got 15 emails a day from the teachers alone. I had the immense pleasure to call or email every day to give her a recap. Every email was sent with a red notification, so every email Mommy had to click on that message every single time. After two weeks, Mommy called and the conversation went like this. Mom, yeah, I saw the emails. This is getting a bit much now. Me, is it? But the last time we spoke here at school, you demanded that every teacher and every worker at school would call and or send you an email about the goings-on of KID. We are simply adhering by your request to be kept up to date and that you hear from my colleagues personally. Mom, you can stop now. Me, unfortunately, we can't. Since KID does all these things, it's our duty to keep parents up to date on what their KID does at school. Also, you requested it and we don't want you to get upset by not knowing what's going on with your KID. Mom, this is getting out of hand. Me. Is it? I don't think so. My colleagues even said they like it so much that you are such an involved parent and that you like to hear from them. Thank you for that. Bye now. Click. This went on for another eight weeks. Mom called or emailed a couple times a week and got the same response from me and the other teachers and personnel. It went like this until Kid messed up on a big scale. While we were busy getting all kinds of help around Kid, he finally bombed every chance to stay at our school. Kid decided that shouting and insulting and wishing the worst possible diseases upon my colleagues and myself weren't enough anymore. When I wanted to talk to him yet again about his behavior, he picked up a chair and decided to get me with it. In full view of the class, a colleague and the cameras, Kid was tackled and pinned down by classmates. Colleagues called the cops, who have their lovely station across the street, got the kids off of him and I managed to get away with no broken bones, but some big bruises. School filed charges for me. The fun part is that I got to sit with Mommy Dearest and Dad, and even then she tried to deny that her son would do such a thing, until she and Dad got to see the footage. The look on their faces was priceless. I wish I had the permission to record it so that I could watch it time and time again with a soda and some popcorn. Kid was expelled, got some hefty community service, and a fine. Normal here. Got a juvenile record as well. To answer a likely question, where was dad in all this? Dad was apparently kept in the dark about what kid did. The emails were sent to his shared email account, but since email on phones wasn't a thing back then, he never saw the emails as she hid them. Dad divorced mom as apparently she has been spinning a lot of lies about a lot of things. Good part? Dad felt so sorry for what his son had done that he sent care packages for all personnel at the school. Best part? We didn't have to deal with kid or mom ever again. We got his brother though and we continued the emails and calls with dad to tell him what a wonderful kid the boy was. ETA, I'm getting a lot of crap that I did nothing to help this kid. I left out what I did as this is malicious compliance. I talked with the school counselor, therapists and even the authorities. We had our suspicions about his behavior. I just had my degree for three years and I know this sudden change is a huge red flag. There was an investigation and it was concluded that there was no reason for further action. The only thing mom kept saying was, my son wouldn't do that, he isn't like that. Did she know something? Maybe. I talked with this kid, treated him fair and honest, tried to see what was going on, referred him to people who he could turn to. 
who, although they are mandated reporters, have confidentiality clause, meaning I don't hear anything he doesn't want me to know. They went to talk to him. He just told them to buzz off. School administration had my back and helped me where they could. I jumped through every hoop possible just to see how and if I could help him. So please cut me some slack. I did what I could and I still wonder if I could have done something more. To get certain help, you need a paper trail. One part is that parents know about the issue. We may have gone far, but we didn't want that mom to say that we didn't contact her in any form. He was a good kid, he just did wrong things and there was no stopping him. He had a mother who defended his every action. I just hope that he has a decent life now, a healthy life with happiness in it. When Evil Mama Bear Tried to Restart the HOA Now the neighborhood my mother's house is in had an HOA that was disbanded in the early 90s for the pretty stereotypical reasons. Corrupt leaders, misappropriation of funds, etc. I really don't have many details on it since I was very little when it went down. But my mother had apparently been openly aiming for a seat on the HOA council for years, so she was really sore when the HOA was gone because she could no longer run for a position. Fast forward to 1999. Evil Mama Bear had been trying to quote the old HOA covenants to the neighborhood for years and insisted that the rules and regulations set forth when the HOA was active should still be abided by. Literally, no one wanted to listen to her. So my mother started putting flyers around the neighborhood that detailed she was restarting the HOA without their approval and would be its first new president. The neighbors ended up in an uproar over this and showed up to her public meeting. And there, she was verbally ripped to shreds as nearly every single homeowner in the neighborhood not only denied their support of another HOA, but also made it clear to her what she was trying to do was not legal. My mother was incensed by this, and no surprise, she didn't even have my father's support, which was something she had initially been counting on. But he refused from the onset of her scheme. And when the neighborhood all refused to recreate the HOA, Evil Mama Bear went off on my dad for not being supportive of her. After she gaslighted herself into nearly being out of breath, my dad told her she was just looking for a way to lord over the neighborhood, and he had never support that. She tried to argue with him some more, but he just ended the conversation and walked away. Somehow, that still didn't stop my mother though. She went and contacted a sleazy lawyer about trying to get the HOA running again without the support of the residents. Her hope was that there was some sort of law that could reactivate the HOA on different grounds. The lawyer went through all of the old HOA documents and state laws over a couple of days and told my mother there was nothing that could be done as it was not enforceable, and that without the consent and signed support of enough people in the neighborhood, there was no way to legally restart the HOA, then proceeded to bill Evil Mama Bear for the time he spent looking through all of that. Since my mother hired the sleazy lawyer herself under the table, she had to pay him, but she hated paying anyone for anything because she was so cheap. Now an important fact of note was that my dad hadn't trusted evil mama bear with his money for years and no longer kept joint bank accounts with her and she had no way to access his money. So she filed for a new credit card using his name and then used said credit card to pay the lawyer instead. My dad noticed a new credit card statement in his name pretty fast and nearly filed for fraud when my mother came clean out of fear. He demanded she pay off the credit card and then have said credit card deactivated. My mother didn't want to, but he threatened to call the fraud department of his bank on her. I still remember hearing the argument where she tried to claim that he couldn't do that because they were married and everything that was his was also hers. And that meant she could do what she did and he'd still have to pay. Dad called BS on that and said he'd contest the charges and get the card removed from his name, which would have left my mother in serious legal trouble for fraud and debt collection. And so evil mama bear begrudgingly paid off the money she owed and my dad cut the card to little pieces with scissors. My mother had the money to pay the lawyer all along. She just preferred to keep her cash and put any expenses she could on my father. But he always stopped her and she had tried to pull the shared assets logic because they were married, though that ended when they divorced. Evil Mama Bear still spent the next few years trying to quote the HOA covenants to neighbors, but she was always dismissed or laughed at every single time she tried. A few people started referring to her as President Wannabe. To this day, no HOA has formed in the neighborhood again. And even if one did, they'd never vote in Evil Mama Bear. I can only imagine what would happen if she tried to pull this crap in Texas after she moves there. Edit. 
I've had a few people messaging me that the lawyer I spoke of in the story that my mother went to wasn't sleazy just by association with my mother and just did what normal lawyers do. Well, he was known by reputation to overcharge people, and my own lawyer told me some time ago that he had first-hand experience with the sleazy lawyer because he knew him in person. The guy would intentionally take longer than needed to do anything so he could charge more time from clients. That, among other shady things he did, bit him in the butt some years ago and he shut down his office. Am I the jerk for shutting down access to my property and lakefront? Background. I recently purchased several acres of wooded property, a good portion of which juts out into a rather large lake. My little peninsula gives me some great lakefront. There's a smallish strip of beach, a dock, and a few boat slips. Because of the woods surrounding the lake, I'm the only lot for several miles that has access to the water without going bushwhacking through the trees. Apparently, over the years, my neighbors have gotten used to taking their boats down my driveway to launch, or going and spending time on the beach. I bought the place over the holidays and just recently moved in at the beginning of the summer, and before anyone introduced themselves to me, I was met with a regular stream of traffic cutting through my lot to the water. At first, I thought it was because I purchased the property and didn't move in right away that everyone just assumed the house and land was vacant and could take advantage until that changed. So I started walking out when I saw people and let them know that I live there now and also making a point to make it obvious the house was lived in. Not much changed, so I got blunt and started asking people directly not to trespass on the property. I wish I could say my direct approach solved the problem, but people would still trek right through. I put up a fence and put up a sign stating private property as well as a sign letting folks know that my dogs were on the property. Once I put the fence up, I started allowing them, the dogs, to roam the property and didn't want any trouble. Unfortunately, my neighbors took the fence and the dogs, despite the fact I owned the dogs well before moving to this lot as an act of aggression. I had a neighbor come to my door and literally yell at me because my dogs barked at her kids when they tried to pull their raft up onto my beach. That same neighbor advised me that my lot has always been the neighborhood entrance to the lake. Apparently, a number of the neighbors built the fire pit and put the tables and rocks and park-like features out there. In chatting with a couple of the friends I've managed to make in my new neighborhood, they confirmed that what the neighbor said was true, that my property has always been more of a park than a private lot. Anyway, while I feel bad that the convenience of nearby lake access has been cut off, I live by myself and I'm personally not comfortable with anyone and everyone just traipsing through my yard. On one hand, I feel like it's absolutely my decision to restrict access to my lot, but on the other, I'm wondering if I'm breaking some sort of unspoken rule of access that was established before I ever got here. Am I the jerk for closing off my property? ETA. I'm not asking for legal advice. I have a lovely attorney and I'm well within my rights to close down access to the property. There is no easement and I own the shoreline. ETA 2. The neighbors took me letting the dogs out on the property as a sign of aggression. They didn't literally take the dogs, as the dogs are a pair of Malinois. Good luck taking them someplace they don't want to go. No, I can't reopen the registers. I manage the retail side of a video game and electronics store slash repair shop. When we get phones in for repair, we tell them up front the turnaround time is about an hour and a half to two hours. We especially emphasize this to the people that drop off around two hours before close. So today was a decent day and we actually managed to get the store closed out by the time we closed at 7. Both registers counted and turned off for the night, trash taken out, everything clean for the night, money on its way to the safe. Our store phones automatically send calls to voicemail starting at 7. And one call tonight just managed to sneak by by all of 5 seconds, so I did the kind thing and picked up. This is how it went. Me. Store name, this is Strawberry, how can I help you? Caller. Y'all close at 7, right? Me. Yeah, we close at 7, and we're technically closed for the night. Caller. Well, I dropped my phone off for repair. Me. Checks name. Yep, I do have the phone right here, repaired and ready for pickup in the morning, as our registers are already closed for the night, and with how the repair system works, they do have to be rung up through the registers. Caller. Why didn't you tell me earlier? I live 30 minutes away. I have work in the morning. I need my phone tonight. Me. I'm sorry. Our registers are closed for the night. I was also present when you dropped the phone off and did hear the associate let you know that the repair would be completed sometime between 6.30 and 
and to be in the area around then. Caller, yelling to someone in the background. And now she's acting like she doesn't even care. And you know darn well she'd be doing everything to get her phone back. Then to me. Y'all only called me 10 minutes ago. I don't live 10 minutes away. You need to open the registers back up. I have the cash. I can just give it to you. Me. I did also check with the technician, and it looks like, according to our records, we reached out to you around 6 tonight. I'm very sorry you're not able to pick it up tonight. Caller. I need your manager or something. Me. Evil smiley face. I am the manager. I'll let you know what options you have, but unfortunately, I can't open the registers and store back up. Caller. I'm leaving y'all a one-star review, and I'm never coming back to y'all again. Me. Sorry to hear that. Is there anything else I can do for you? Caller. More yelling in the background. Me. Okie dokie. Have a great night. Hangs up. After I hang up the phone, about a minute later, the new voicemail alarm goes off. Then again, two minutes after that. Meaning, she tried to call back two more times and left angry voicemails, which couldn't get through. It was very clear that she was still at home when she called, which would have meant me keeping my staff here for at minimum 45 extra minutes past their scheduled end time because we can't close alone. Poor planning on your part does not necessitate an emergency on mine. Am I the jerk for kicking my best friend out of my house because she mocked my other best friend? So we're three best friends in our early 30s. We've been together since high school. I'm going to use fake names for the post. It's Mary and Helen. Mary is child-free by choice, and so am I. I don't intend on ever having kids, since I don't think I'd be capable of being a good parent, and I don't want to have the responsibility of another tiny human. Helen, on the other hand, was always a I-want-to-have-a-family kind of person. We always used to tease her for that, but in a non-offensive way, and even if she felt offended, she'd tell us and we'd stop. She's the odd one out, but we still adore her. To be honest, I used to have a very weird mindset that women who have kids are not truly happy and they just pretend to be. I overcame that mindset and I now accept that while some women are pressured by society to become moms because it's what's expected of them, they're indeed miserable for the most part, but other women are genuinely happy to be moms and it's bringing joy into their lives. Helen gave birth to a baby girl four months ago. Once we found out about her pregnancy, both Mary and I were extremely happy to be this baby's aunts. Once Helen gave birth, Mary and I were always there to support her and comfort her. She has a husband, and he's a gorgeous man, but we as friends also thought we had to do our part. At first, everything was going smoothly. Then, Mary downloaded TikTok, and she ended up on the child-free side of it, which is normal, but then it started affecting her whole personality to the point that now, in the span of three months, she started despising kids and has shown bitterness to moms. She always texts me privately out of our trio group chat chatting crap about Helen and the fact she's a mom and how she's going to change now and will probably grow apart. I shut down these convos pretty quickly and I tell her not to base her personality on what social media tells her to. She kept being weird about moms and kids and she started making bitter comments towards Helen too. Helen would always ask if everything's okay and Mary wouldn't elaborate. Helen definitely picked up on Mary's change of behavior. Yesterday, Helen would visit my house with the baby and Mary would come too. At some point, the kids started crying because, duh, it's a baby, it cries. And Mary started making comments like, That little jerk won't shut up. Helen, please come alone next time without the crying creature. I told her to cut it off, seeing Helen was getting upset and uncomfortable. She wouldn't stop and I told her that if she can't shut her mouth, she should leave my house. She said she's not obligated to accept Helen's kid just because she's her friend. I said I agree, but the least she could do is respect her. She left and called me the jerk for siding with Helen and the baby instead of her while I'm also child free. Am I the jerk? You'll be calling your lawyer? Just what I want to hear. As a former school board privacy officer, I deal with many FOI requests from the public that dealt with anything from salaries of senior employees to value of contracts awarded to emails about routine business. Occasionally, someone would submit a very complex request that would require a lot of time to complete. So it was with one parent who wanted thousands of emails, committee meeting minutes, reports, and the personal notes of a dozen different school board employees. The reason? She had requested that her kid's bus stop move from the entrance to the cul-de-sac she lived in to ride in front of her house. 
while the difference was only about 100 meters, 109 yards. The request was denied because the circle at the end of the cul-de-sac was too small for the bus to turn around. After working on the request for more than a month, she grew impatient and demanded to know what was taking so long. I tried to explain I was a one-man operation, but she started making accusations that I was part of a conspiracy against her. She demanded that I produce all the records immediately or I will contact my lawyer. Now I'm smart enough to know that anyone who says I will contact my lawyer doesn't have one, especially not one who specializes in freedom of information requests. But playing along, I said, oh, we don't want it to come to that. I'll finish this today and hung up. So I did. The legislation requires that we charge $7.50 per 15 minutes of search time for records, plus $7.50 per 15 minutes of preparation time, redacting personal information, eliminating non-responsive info, etc., plus other incidental costs, copying, printing, etc. Because I had to have ICT help with the emails and computer records, the charges added up rapidly. I called her back the next day and told her the first batch of records would be ready by the end of the week. Then I asked how she'd like to pay the costs. The costs? She said. What costs? How much? $4,870, I said. As I'm sure your lawyer will explain, 50% is payable up front before we proceed any further with a request. Then we can start on the next batch. Dead quiet on the other end of the phone. You haven't heard the end of this. I'm calling the local news, she shouted and hung up. It's now three years later, and I'm still waiting. One balloon per person, you say? Alrighty then, I choose this one. This happened a couple of years back on my coworker's birthday. I ran out that morning to the party store to grab a small balloon bouquet. Wasn't going for anything fancy, just one Mylar birthday balloon with two or three solid colored latex balloons to match. A fairly standard arrangement. It was a little after 10 a.m., the store had just opened and I was the only customer in there. I walked up to the counter to order my balloons and the woman working there asks me if I had pre-ordered. I told her I hadn't and she informed me that she couldn't do it for me. Apparently, if I didn't pre-order, it was their store policy that they could only do one balloon per person per visit. I looked around. I'm still the only customer in the store. Now, I would totally get why this would be something the store would have to enforce if there were other people waiting. But again, there was nobody else there, and filling up three to four regular balloons would maybe take about two minutes tops, and it was pretty obvious at this point that this lady was really just being lazy. I apologized and explained that I wasn't aware of their policy and would remember to call ahead in the future, but asked if she could help me out because I was trying to get them for my coworker whose birthday was that day. She answered me abruptly with a, sorry, store policy. I think about it for a second, then tell her to hold on for a minute. If I can only get one balloon, I would like to pick a different one. I went back to one of the birthday party aisles and found a package for a full-bodied Mickey Mouse balloon. Now, if you've ever seen one of these full-bodied character balloons, you'll know that it's made up of multiple parts, head, arms, body, legs, feet, etc., that need to be individually blown up and then assembled to create the character. This is then completed with putting weights and rollers on the feet so your balloon can walk. It's technically one balloon though. I went back and handed the package to the lady at the front counter, shrugged and said, if I can only get one balloon, it might as well be a good one. I then proceeded to watch her struggle to figure out how to assemble it for the next 15 to 20 minutes. I can't say I've ever spent $20 on a single balloon before, but it was totally worth it to watch this lady angrily assemble my single balloon, when if she had just done what I had originally asked for, I probably would have already been back at my office. I only wish I could have watched her watch me as I left walking hand in hand out of that door with my freshly created Mickey Mouse balloon. Am I the jerk for telling my friend that he's basically an employee of his dad and not a business owner like he says he is? My friend Jay comes from a wealthy family as his dad owns several successful businesses. He's not a snob, but recently he's become a bit preachy about how it's better to be an entrepreneur than an employee. We've talked about it several times before. I've been working for a financial company for nine years and he always asks me about when I would put up my own business. I told him that I enjoy my current job because I get paid all right, have a great time with my coworkers, and learn many things from my clients. Jay said that I'm wasting my time working for a company that pays me so little compared to what I could earn if I were a business owner. I told him that I do have plans of having my own business someday, but that requires a large amount of capital and is a huge risk that I'm not yet comfortable taking. 
He said that I've been an employee for nine years, so if not now, when? And that you can only get the reward if you take the risk. I usually try to brush things off because I know that Jay has good intentions. He's just a little out of touch with how hard it can be to put up your own business and be successful at it since his dad's businesses have been there all his life. But the other day he was telling me about one of his cousins who asked for advice in college majors. He told me that he told his cousin to go for a business degree, work for two years to get some experience and then have his own business, just like Jay said he did. He also told his cousin to remember to aspire for greater things and not be satisfied with being an employee forever. I was a bit irked about the last part and told him that, hey, there's nothing wrong with being an employee forever and not everyone is cut to or wants to be a business owner. He said, yes, there's nothing wrong with being an employee forever, but if you're smart or have any ambition, you would want to have your own business instead of working for someone else your whole life. I told Jay that if he thinks that being a business owner is the best way to succeed financially, then why hasn't he put up his own business? He said that he does have his own business, referring to the construction firm his dad founded, which he now manages, and he doesn't have to put up a new one since his family already has one in place. I asked how it's his if he isn't the registered owner, needs approval from his dad for all major decisions, and doesn't control the company's income. I said that he's basically an employee who happens to be related to the owner, and the monthly allowance he gets for running the business is his salary. He didn't reply to me after that and hasn't talked to me since. Am I the jerk? My mom stole my $150,000 inheritance and kicked me out of the family when I asked her to pay it back. My mother has me all kinds of messed up, and I'm not sure if I should just walk away. Backstory I'm 27, female, and my mom, who's 53, has had a really hard life. She was in an accident at age 5 and lost her mother. She didn't have an active father, and no one on her mom's side wanted to take her in, so she went into foster care for a few years. Not a good experience from what she told me. At age 8, she was adopted into a loving, wealthy family of two college professors along with an adopted brother. She had a hard time adjusting, made a lot of bad decisions, and basically ran away in her late teens. This whole time, her adopted parents were doing everything they could to reach out to their daughter and help her get back on her feet, but mostly their efforts were wasted. She has a kid at age 18, then again a few years later. She lost them to foster care, and then had me with a different man. Eventually, she gets her two first kids back, my older half-brothers, has me, marries twice again, and has two more kids, my younger brothers. In total, she has five kids, four boys with me, the middle girl. We grew up very, very poor, with our mother always gone or bringing back strangers to party, leaving me to raise the youngest two. We would visit our grandparents, mom's adopted parents, for holidays and special occasions, but with my mother's strained relationship with them, we weren't able to visit as much as we kids would have liked to. My childhood was crappy to say the least. That being said, I loved my grandparents, especially my grandpa, dearly, and they loved us kids back. And as much as they struggled with my mom, they were nothing but loving towards her from what I understand. The thing about my grandparents is that education was very important to them. I remember the encouragement for college started very early on from them and they made it very clear that I was expected to go to college. When I was allowed to visit them, they would take me to bookstores and let me loose. They'd say, okay, pick one, and I would come back with three or four unable to decide. They'd laugh and get me all the books, which I could not believe. I took pride in knowing my grandparents thought so highly of my future and was determined to keep making them proud. Fast forward to 2005, I'm in fifth grade and my grandma passed from long-term alcohol use. My mom has a wake-up call and gets sober, but is still absent from AA meetings and general disinterest. Then in seventh grade, my grandpa passed as well from the same illness. This crushed me. I wasn't able to articulate any of it at the time, but that's when the big-time depression rolled in. From there on, school was very difficult for me, as well as my home life. I ended up falling pretty deep into my sorrow and stopped going to school around my junior year of high school. After a breakthrough, I decided that I had to get the heck away from that house and ultimately moved out at age 17 to a bigger city about 45 minutes away. I barely finished high school with a 1.75 GPA and somehow, two teachers from the new school convinced me to sign up for the community college. They helped me fill out my FAFSA and everything. Side note, when I received my mom's financial info for that year for the FAFSA, I saw she claimed to make around $10,000 a year. That's how poor we were. After my first semester in college, I was hooked. 
Science was actually pretty cool. I realized I loved to learn and kept pushing through. I worked full time, busted my tail, and after four years, I finally achieved an associate's degree. But that wasn't enough for me. I was able to transfer over to a university that I would have never been able to attend right out of high school due to grades and whatnot, and finish my BS in my favorite field of science. In total, it took me six years to get my BS degree, but I worked so hard and I was so proud of what I was able to accomplish. Keep in mind, during my whole college career, my mother was characteristically absent and dismissive of what I was doing. When I was in my early 20s, still at community college, she packed up her and my baby brothers and moved five hours up north. I didn't have a car and couldn't come see them hardly at all. I was upset by this, of course, but that didn't matter to her. She eventually moved back a couple of years later. Anyway, I graduate college with $40,000 college debt. Not so bad compared to most I always thought. I knew that I would have to work hard and accrue debt to get where I wanted in life, so this was a necessary burden and I've accepted that. However, things have turned in recent events and my effort to get closer to my late grandparents. I reached out to their close personal friends, let's call them the Johnsons, to get a better idea of what my grandparents were like. They were so close that the Johnsons were actually the arbiter of my grandpa's will. In conversation, it came out that when my grandparents passed away, they left a $150,000 inheritance for their grandchildren's education. However, three years later, around 2010, my mother came to the Johnsons and confessed to them that she blew all of the education money. On what? I have no idea. But I do remember her buying a two-door sports car, our only car for a six-person family after grandpa passed, so I'm sure the rest of her purchases were great investments. This was really upsetting to me for many reasons. I was the only grandchild that actually went to college, and that money could have easily covered my expenses. If I'd had that money, I wouldn't have had to spend every moment for six years busting my tail. I could have afforded to only have one job instead of three. I could have spent that time studying and getting better grades, or doing an internship, which literally makes or breaks your career in my field. I wasn't able to do any of that and haven't been able to get a related job. Not the worst thing, but unfortunate. I have a fine job in tech that I wouldn't have been able to get without my degree. I'm plenty happy with my decision. My relationship with her was already strained, but this really crossed a line for me. I emailed her telling her I knew what she did and she needed to pay me back. That's probably not going to happen. She owns a small business in social media and it doesn't do that great. I kind of want to just cut ties forever but I'm so angry. I also want her to pay me back the money she stole. I'm so out of my debt. I don't know what to do. Am I the jerk for flexing my real world success on my terrible former high school teacher? I'm 23, male, and my former high school encourages all parents to attend parent teacher conferences. So my parents always go to my younger brother, who's 17, as conferences. He's a senior in high school and has the same teacher I did back when I was his age. This guy was a terrible teacher. He was condescending and snarky, and he always started crap with me. I always got excellent grades since I was smart, but he never liked me. I didn't like him either. And at the end of the year, he told me I'd never make it in the real world. I think he picked me out because I was confident and outgoing, and it made him insecure. In reality, I was always going to make it in the real world, and he probably realized I would surpass him pretty quickly. Maybe he was jealous or something, I don't know. And I already have. I just graduated college a year ago and already have a nice job in finance that pays more than he'll ever dream of stuck in a classroom. So I decided to take my brother to conferences instead of my parents so I could give him a nice life update and check in. He looked wary and surprised when he saw me. To paraphrase how the whole conversation went, he was like, Hey, how have you been, OP? I haven't seen you in a bit. And I was like, Yeah. It's been a minute, Andy. I don't have much time to come around. I just graduated college with honors, and my new job in finance keeps me pretty busy. The pay makes it well worth it, though. How about you? Did you get promoted to principal yet? I knew he hadn't, since my brother told me he had run for the open principal position and didn't win. He was like, no, but that's okay, to save face. And I was like, yeah, and you always have this cute little classroom. Man, I forgot how small it is. Charming. And he was indignant, like, Yes, I quite like it. He gave me my brother's report card when the conference was almost over. 
I knew his wife had a baby since my mom follows her on Facebook and is always telling me things like that. I said as I got up to go, Well, I'm sure your wife must be so pleased with you making it in the real world as a teacher. I'm sure you're bringing in so much dough for the family with this little gig. Maybe you'll even upgrade to a medium-sized classroom one day. Bye, Andy, and started walking out. I gave him the thumbs up sign and he gave me a sarcastic wave really aggressively. I could tell he was steaming. Am I the jerk for flexing on my crappy teacher and proving him wrong that I'm the one who couldn't make it in the real world? Bruh. Denied a raise and moved to overnight position and told, don't care how you do your job, just do it? Okay, I will. I used to work in hotels in a ski town in Colorado. Very expensive, but the quality of life, very common saying there. I had started at a new hotel and was making $10 an hour living with my brother in a two-bedroom place that was 700 square feet. Rent was half our income. When the slow season approached, I was told I would have to move to night audit, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., or risk being let go. The problem was, I lived three miles from the hotel and took the bus to get there since I couldn't afford a car. The bus did not run at night or early morning, so I would be walking six miles a day and several inches to a foot or more of snow. So I asked for a raise. They said they'd get back to me, but need an answer, and I needed the job, so okay, I'll work night audit. I start the next week as an auditor, and while I'm being trained, I learn that I'm also losing a day. The other auditor works three days, and I'll be working four days, not five. That's $320 a month hit to my income before taxes, so I'll need to be making $12.50 an hour to keep making the same with the cut hours, but I decide I'm going to ask for $14. I complete training and meet with my GM. He asks how I'm liking it, and I start off with my concerns. I tell him I wasn't told I'd lose a day, and with having to walk six miles a day in the snow, I was going to need a raise to $14 an hour. He let out an audible sigh and tells me he can easily hire someone for this position for $10 an hour and to take it or leave it. I knew it would be very hard to find a job in the winter when everything closes up, so I stayed. As I walked out of his office, he says, I don't care how you do your job, just do it. Okay, I will. You see, this job was easy. It was seven hours of me doing absolutely nothing and one hour of actual work, which gave me plenty of time to find shortcuts. The software we used allows us to import scripts that you downloaded from the developer site. One such script was a way to make my job literally one click. The problem was it was $500 a year license for it. Obviously, I wouldn't propose to my GM a way to eliminate my job, but there was a free trial on every script for seven days. I remember at the time, you get around paywalls on news websites by going into the web console and simply removing the paywall from the source code. I decided to see if this was something I could do with this script, and what do you know? I downloaded it and opened the script in a text editor, and the only thing making this script a trial was a line that said, License expires, and had the date set seven days out from when I downloaded it. I changed the computer's date to eight days from now and tried to run the script in our software and got a notification that said the free trial had ended. So I changed it back and set the expiration date to 2050. This took my manual job of one hour and made it three to five minutes. All I had to do was specify a date range and check off what reports I wanted done and print it and click start. That was it. I always manually reviewed everything just in case. But that wasn't it. We had a kitchen where we made breakfast and dinner for the guests. Evening shift got free dinner and morning shift got free breakfast. I didn't get anything. They eventually decided to have the auditors set up breakfast so the kitchen crew didn't have to come in as early. I asked if we got free breakfast and was told no. Despite setting everything up to make their jobs easier, I should also note that we had to clean any dishes left from dinner that the kitchen didn't get to despite not even getting any dinner. But I had the kitchen all to myself for 6 hours, so I started making myself dinner around 1am, whatever I wanted. The only limits were the ingredients in the kitchen and since I was responsible for dishes from other shifts, I never left any evidence behind. I no longer had to buy food to bring to work. I later realized that I could put dirty dishes back in the return bin since it was covered and the breakfast crew never checked to see if any dirty dishes were in it and the very few times they did check, they assumed dinner forgot to check before leaving. I always cleaned up the dishes I used to make myself food out of fairness though. 
So now my job no longer requires me to do dishes. I get free food. And all I have to do is remember the date and click a button to do my actual job. What am I to do with all this time? I watched so many shows. I played online games on my laptop. I started learning Spanish. The GM did say he didn't care how I did my job, just do it, and so I did. I did eventually decide to move away for a much better job far away and had to give up the comfy life. I trained my replacement the way I was doing things, including the script, and did not teach him the manual way. Before I left though, I decided to change the trial date to one week out. Two days after my last day, the front desk manager texts me and tells me that the other night auditor was just fired for making mean remarks to a guest and that guest recorded him, so he was fired once the GM got in. He asked if I could come back until they got someone else and said they'd pay me $15 an hour. Unfortunately, I was leaving in two days, so there was no way. I got a call from the GM at about 5 a.m. the day of the expiration, and he asked about this free trial thing, and why wasn't the new guy trained how to do the audit properly, which was apparently working seven days a week, since no one else knew the audit except the new guy, and of course me. I reminded him that he told me he didn't care how I did my job, just do it. So I did exactly that. I could tell he wanted to yell, but he held back. He then demanded I come back and fix it or he'll have to take legal action. I told him I was already at my new place 2,000 miles away, but I would happily do it for airfare, a free room, free meals while I'm there, and $10,000. That was when he lost it and I hung up. He texted me after saying he was contacting the lawyers and that I messed up and to prepare to face the consequences. That was five years ago, and I haven't heard anything from him since. I did eventually go back to that town a few months ago to see my mom and ran into the front desk manager from that place who's a really nice guy. He told me the GM was caught hooking up with the head housekeeper in his office by his wife one day, later divorced him. The 19-year-old girl working the front desk in the mornings later filed harassment charges against him, and he resigned after that. The AGM jumped ship after that. The GM was also a coach for a baseball team and hit somebody with a bat and got beat up by the dad. Not sure what happened to him after that. The front desk manager now runs the place as the GM and he's made sure that he, the AGM, and the FDM are all trained to do the audit. Am I the jerk for telling my best friend she's not equal to my fiance? I'm 28 and engaged to a great man the same age as me. We've been dating since we were 16 and got engaged at 24, four years ago. I have a best friend, Angela, who's also 28. She's a woman as well as me. Angela has barely grown out of the high school mentality. She still acts like she did back then, clubbing every weekend, hooking up, always out with friends, new and old. She never had a boyfriend or a girlfriend. She only has had situationships, so she doesn't know how commitment works. I don't judge her for that since she seems fine with her life and I'm happy that my friends are being themselves and I get to be myself despite having different interests. Lately, I had my suspicions that Angela believes that she still comes before my fiance just because we were each other's number one priority in high school. I tried to slip in multiple times without being confrontational that my fiance and I are gonna have a family soon and how he's my priority and so on just to get the message across without having some uncomfortable conversation. She didn't seem to get it though and something dramatic ended up happening. Angela's birthday was two days ago, and she planned on having a celebration tomorrow night. The place she picked was a dance show club. I texted her and told her I wouldn't feel comfortable to attend because clubs like that cross me and my fiance's boundaries. It's not because we don't trust each other, but we just don't feel comfortable with that in our relationship. Anyone who knows about this boundary has told us it's a normal boundary. Angela said that I would be stupid to imply that I'll skip her birthday. I said that we could hang out, the two of us, someday and go for drinks, but I just don't feel comfortable attending a club like this. She said, But I'm your best friend. You're not going to skip your best friend's birthday, are you? I said, Sadly, I'll skip it, but I insisted on an alternative for another day. She got disappointed and said she didn't expect me to ever put a man's needs over our friendship. I reminded her he's my fiancé. She argued that him being a fiancé of mine doesn't mean he deserves special treatment over her. I told her that's exactly what she means, and I reminded her that she's not equal to my fiancé anymore in such situations because he's the person I'm going to marry and have a family with, and he's my number one priority. I probably shouldn't have said that because she claims I'm the jerk 
and I replaced her when I used to have her as my number one. I apologized for that phrasing and tried to explain what I meant, but she wasn't having it and said I should go cry to my fiancé and she doesn't need my fake apology. I didn't mean to hurt her feelings and I just felt like she was pushing me and I had a one-sided competition with my fiancé and I said that. Am I the jerk? Update. So I come here with an update and the problem is totally behind us now. She was the one to call me and apologized for lashing out at me and she wanted to meet and talk so we could resolve it and put it behind us. She said that she's scared she's going to lose me because we've been friends for almost two decades and she doesn't want our friendship to stop existing. I told her there's no way that will happen, but as I respect her life choices and I never intervene, she has to respect my choices as well. I listened to some comments who said I'm judgmental of her lifestyle and I decided to ask her if she ever felt that way about me. She said she never felt like I'm judging her and that I'm more accepting of her lifestyle than some of her friends who also have that lifestyle she has. She said I'm not obligated to agree with her lifestyle and it's her fault she can't realize how different choices work in life because she just never had to experience changing her priorities growing up. I told her it's nobody's fault here and as long as she doesn't harm anyone directly, she can't apologize for making different choices about her own life. The bottom line is that she said she'll try to be more understanding of how priorities shift in people's lives and she admitted that she was shady a few times just to uplift herself but realized what she did was wrong and immature and will try to communicate better. I also explained better to her that my fiancé being my priority does not mean I love my friends any less. It just means that since I'm going to share my life with that person, sometimes their comfort will come first when it's about boundaries. Anyway, I explained in detail what I mean and that boundaries don't mean I no longer love or respect her, but just like I respect she's chosen that life for herself, she has to respect that this is also the life I choose. As long as I don't actively go out of my way to either insult or ghost her just to back my fiancé, she has nothing to worry about. Her party is today, and she decided that we should go have drinks with all of the other girls earlier, and later whoever wants to follow to the club can go. But she made the plans that way, so I could also be included in her birthday celebration somehow. Now we are good, and I'm glad it didn't take long before we could resolve it. P.S. For those who said I'm being judgmental of her lifestyle, FYI, I actually decided to show my friend the Reddit post and the comments, and she laughed at those who were upset about my high school mentality comment. She said, But it's true. I'm still stuck in high school with my spirit. Why do these people take it personally? She also never took offense to me using that phrase. We've used it for years after we ended high school, and she never once felt offended. Believe me, if she did feel offended, she'd make sure I know, so you people can calm down with those accusations. Just because you've given that phrase a negative meaning, it doesn't mean my friend and I use it in a demeaning way. It's a lighthearted comment to us, and it's pointless for you to get offended on her behalf when she doesn't even feel offended. She gave me the side eye for writing on Reddit about it, but in a sarcastic and joking manner, she wasn't actually mad. She said she would do the same, and she even thought of posting her point of view here as well unless our problem was sorted out, but now it's done and we're fine. Thank you for all the comments. Tell her I'll take your spot at the club. I need a break from Reddit boy over here. One electronic item per tray? Sure, no problem. This happened yesterday as I was returning home from a two-week trip to Germany. The final leg of the flight departed from Paris, where I had this lovely interaction with the agents whom, despite me knowing are not TSA, I still refer to as TSA in my mind. While going through security in the airport, I know the drill. Belts off, jackets off, take the laptop out of my bag. So I submit to the x-ray four trays. One with my carry-on, one with my laptop by itself, one with my belt, watch and jacket, and one with my personal items. Think of fanny pack. I'm randomly selected for further screening. I have a Lebanese last name and a beard. I'm always randomly selected for further screening. And the agent berates me for putting all my electronics together. I point out that I took my laptop out of the bag, as per standard procedure, and the agent says, screaming at me mind you, that that is not enough. I must take out every electronic device from my carry-on and put each of them in an individual tray, as I'm being sent to the back of the line to do so. Here comes the malicious compliance. There are two things this French TSA agent is unaware of. The first thing is that I'm a videographer by trade, and I was in Europe to cover an event, spiel with video footage and interviews. The second thing is that Air France changed my flight times, so my two hours layover became a 10 hours layover, which I'm not particularly happy about. 
so I'm being sent to the end of the line and I have to submit each electronic item individually. Sure, no complaints from me. Two camera bodies, one drone, one GoPro, four lenses, nine batteries, and two lavalier microphones later, there is no more space in the treadmill. People behind me are complaining that they will miss their flight because I'm taking so long. There's nothing I can do. I'm just following the orders I received. And at this point, I only unpacked my photography vest and fanny pack. The treadmill starts moving. Some space clears up to put additional trays, and that's when I open my carry-on bag. Again, I'm in Europe for work. I didn't bring any nice clothes or shoes or anything. All my personal effects are in the checked-in luggage. The carry-on is filled exclusively with electronics. I still have four microphones, two recorders, lights, additional lenses, battery chargers, video monitors, audio monitors, drone controllers. Once I open my carry-on, it's very clear for everyone with an eyesight that I'm not even one-third of the way done. One electronic per tray? Sure thing. I'll just occupy this entire checkpoint by myself then. The people behind me in line are literally jumping and screaming about their missed flight to the point the security agents leave their post to control the line. Someone in a non-uniform suit appears and talks to the agent who sent me to the back of the line. That's when the unthinkable happened. The agent comes to me and says there would be no need for me to continue separating my electronics and I could just submit my entire carry-on bag as a single item and they'd examine it further if it seemed necessary. You sure? I asked. Because it's no bother at all. I can keep unpacking here all day long. They insist it's not necessary, but I still have over 20 trays at this point occupying the treadmill. I go through the metal detector. I spend some minutes recovering and repacking everything, and based on the amount of fuming passengers, I like to think I contributed to the airport reviewing their stance on x-raying individual electronics. Am I the jerk for kicking out my sister-in-law after her daughter ate my wife's pregnancy snacks? My wife is on her first and last pregnancy. She's in her early 20s but has had holes in her uterus in the past and miscarried previously. This one is super high risk and the doctor's visits have been frequent and stressful. After this, my wife will be getting sterilized and I'll be getting vasectomy. She's currently 7 months pregnant and all she's been craving is plain grilled ground beef soaked in garlic powder red crushed pepper and sriracha and peanut caramel marzipan. As the person who has had to smell it and kiss her, I prefer to spoil her with the marzipan and it's much quicker for her to be able to eat. I'm doing my best to spoil her because this is her first and only full-term pregnancy she'll be able to experience. I bulk bought some marzipan candies for her and placed them in her cubby in the pantry where she keeps her maternal vitamins, anti-nausea pills and snacks. My wife's sister came to visit with her daughter for two weeks, this Sunday, and we welcomed them to the pantry but asked that they not touch anything in the cubbies because those are especially for us. I went out to run errands the other day and came home to my wife on the couch holding her stomach and crying. I assumed the worst and asked what was wrong and she told me that niece had eaten up all of her marzipan and there was no ground beef and it's all she wanted and everything else smelled disgusting. I asked my sister-in-law about it and she said it was just candy, and my wife shouldn't be eating so much sugar during her pregnancy anyways, and that she can't expect a kid not to want candy. I asked her to replace it, and she said no, and that I could buy it since it was so precious. I told her to leave the next morning, and she groaned and grunted around about how bad I'm treating family around the house till she left. My wife's family is calling me a jerk for kicking them out over something so silly, and that I could have just bought more. It all feels so silly, but I'm beginning to doubt myself here. Extra info. My wife does have a balanced pregnancy diet, approved by her OBGYN, we try to adhere to, consisting of oatmeal, fruit, rice and beans, chicken, baked or grilled, vegetables, mineral water, and vitamins. The cravings are not all she eats, it's just what she eats when she's craving it. Please have a little more faith in me as a husband that I won't gorge my wife on sweets while she's in a high-risk pregnancy. Final edit. I received my verdict. However, when things calm down, I will be speaking to my sister-in-law and trying to make amends if she's willing to apologize. My niece is nowhere at fault because her mother should have parented her. My wife is fine now. She's eating a big bowl of ground beef as I type this. I showed her the comments from other pregnant women and she really appreciated them. She doesn't feel so alone in her mommy madness anymore. Thank you all for your time. Karen tries to make me do yoga. 
Our family has pancake Sundays, which is where our house gets together for a sit-down family breakfast with my mom's infamous pancakes. As you would expect, I'm always down for it. Love family time, love pancakes. My family is also very active and athletic and usually does a workout or yoga in the mornings. However, I'm not a very athletic or active person, and because I hate being compared to the rest of my family, I hate feeling weak while they exercise. I usually don't work out with them. Last week, I did do yoga though, because my mom asked and it was Mother's Day. This week, my mom said I wasn't allowed pancakes unless I did yoga with them again. I said that was fine, I still wasn't going to do the yoga, but was a bit upset that she was trying to force me to do something I didn't want to do. In the morning, my sisters kept texting me for me to come to breakfast, but I didn't really want to because watching everyone else enjoy pancakes, while I didn't, wasn't super appealing to me. Finally, I went up because I didn't really want to miss family breakfast, only to see that my mom made my favorite crepe pancakes that she only makes for birthdays, along with fruit and whipped cream. Take note that I had told mom that I missed her crepes a few times, but she waited until I couldn't eat them to make them. I really didn't want to watch everyone else enjoy the food while I couldn't and was getting upset that she tried to go out of her way to punish me for not working out with her and I didn't want to be around my family when I was getting upset like that, so I went to go downstairs. My stepdad stopped me and in front of the whole family told me off for not wanting to spend time with my family, for not contributing to the family, for my mom always having to push me to do anything. I didn't really say anything. I've been taught not to talk back to my parents but I can't help but feel upset. I take walks with my mom and sister whenever she asks. It's only been a couple of times in the past year of lockdown that I said I didn't want to go. Whenever the lawn needs to be mowed or they need help, I'm always the one they ask. My other siblings comparatively don't help out as much and yet I'm always the one who gets criticized. I feel ridiculous for getting so upset over something so stupid and I don't want to face them right now because I honestly can't tell if I'm in the right or not. Karen wants to go to Disneyland with us, but she's broke. I haven't taken my kids on a real vacation since before lockdown, but now that we've all had our shots, I want to take them to Disneyland. My brother Jack, whose kids are about the same age, feels the same. Disneyland is expensive. The trip will be about $8,000 each family total, but my brother and I both have good jobs, so it's not a struggle for us. My sister, Jane, is always talking about how broke and underpaid she is, and complaining about her student loans. I don't know her salary, but she's a social worker, so I know it's not a ton. Well, my brother and I figured she wouldn't be able to afford it based on a couple weeks ago when she brought up the idea of a vacation at a Labor Day cookout, and she just went on about how she wishes she could afford a family vacation. Well, since she said she couldn't, we just didn't invite her and planned a trip with our wives and our kids. This weekend, people were over, and my nephew, Jack's son, brought up how excited he is for Disney, to which Jane asked about it and the details came out. We had just decided in the last week to go there, and then Jane got all mad for not getting invited. I told her I didn't invite her because she literally said she couldn't afford a vacation. She then said I was rubbing it in that we make more money than her and that we could have covered part of her trip and then had a real family vacation with everyone. I just felt like, as we're all adults with our own families, we're past the age I'd be subsidizing her for anything that's not an emergency. But then yesterday, she sent a really passive-aggressive text about it, basically calling us jerks. This hasn't been planned for a long time. We had just started planning it a few days before my nephew spilled the beans. Trip is in December. Plan was originally not to tell the kids yet, but my sister-in-law got overexcited and shared with her kids. People are saying we just assumed she couldn't afford it. She literally told us she can't afford a vacation while we were initially discussing going on a vacation, so we planned one based on our budgets. I didn't think that after the vacation was chosen, we had to go back and tell her, especially after choosing a pricey destination. That would feel like rubbing salt in the wound. Want me to cancel all your subscriptions? Yeah, I can do that. I used to work at a call center for one of the biggest teleproviders in our country. Mobile subscriptions, internet, landlines, all that. The call center I worked at was also only for business clients and not private customers, so it was not unusual for a client to have a lot of mobile subscriptions. One thing to note, I'm not sure how changing a mobile provider in other countries works, but in my country, you have to get the other company you want to transfer to to order the numbers from where you are now to them. 
You cannot cancel your subscription and then have it transferred. If you cancel your subscription, it stops working right away. If you want to transfer after that, then you need to order a reopening of the subscription on that phone number for it to be able to transfer to the other teleprovider. And the reopening is treated as a new order and a new subscription, so it's an ordeal to go through. Also, and this is important for the story, if you have a debt collection case for an invoice with the teleprovider you are currently at, you will then no longer be able to get new subscriptions with that company until the debt collection is paid in full. Now on to the story. I get a call in from a customer who had maybe 10 to 15 mobile subscriptions with us as well as an internet subscription and apparently they worked with sales. The customer was very angry on the phone. He tells me that they have received a debt collection case from us for an invoice they had not paid, which was true. There was an invoice in our systems that they had not paid and it had indeed gone to collection. He then told me that he knew about the invoice but had just not bothered to pay it. What did you expect to happen if you didn't pay it? He then proceeded to berate me for sending them a debt collection and demanded that we cancel it immediately. One other thing to note is that none of the people that worked on the floor of the call center have the authority to cancel the debt collection cases. We need to send a case to another department for that. He would not let me send a case, nor would he let me call a supervisor to maybe expedite things. He said that I should cancel it right away or he would cancel all of their subscriptions right this second. Q malicious compliance. Normally when people threaten to cancel their subscriptions because of reasons, they mean they want to transfer to another provider and I usually refer them to contact that other provider so they can start the process. This time, however, since the customer was being a jerk, I did not do that. I asked point blank, me, do you want to cancel your subscriptions with us immediately? Customer, yes, me, are you sure? Him, yes, me. Okay then, I will cancel all your subscriptions right this second. Good, jerk. Then he hung up. I logged the call with every detail that he had said and asked me to and added an extra line of, if any doubts, just listen to the recording of the call. I got added and went ahead and canceled all of the subscriptions this client had with us, all of them, even their internet subscription. After about an hour, one of my coworkers got a very angry call from the client who was forced to call from another phone because guess what? Their subscription was canceled. I was done for the day, so I just went home, but my coworker filled me in the next day. The client had yelled and screamed that they were no longer able to call out or receive calls as well as their internet was down. He had read the log I created and informed the client that they had terminated our services, so of course they would not receive any calls nor make them. They demanded that we reopen the subscription again so that they could do their work. But again, my coworker had to inform them that it would not be possible since they had a debt collection case that needed to be paid first or else none of the orders they put in would go through. After more screaming and losing it, my coworker had to end the call. The next day I had the evening shift, but I had saved the client's information to see if anything else had happened. Apparently the debt collection got paid and the subscriptions were reopened. They also had ordered a transfer to another provider. I have no idea how much money was lost, but for a sales team to not be able to work for over 24 hours, I can only guess that it was a lot. Also, as a cherry on top of things, they were in a contract period with us, which means that they get a small discount on their subscriptions if they are with us for a set period of time. If they break that contract, which they did when they told me to cancel their subscriptions as well as transferring to another provider afterwards, they had to pay a fee of over $300 per subscription. That was at least $4,500 on top of what they lost the 24 hours they couldn't do anything. All because they didn't want to pay a $30 late fee. Manager told me to ask the dishwasher for help, so I did. For a little backstory, I used to work at this fast food place. The manager never did their job and let it fall on everyone else. For many different reasons, that would take a whole other post to mention. I decided to quit. When I turned my two weeks notice in, the manager ripped it up and threw it away, then went on about how they were so upset that I decided to leave. They usually took it personally when someone quit. Two weeks later, I'm working my last day. The manager scheduled me to close and to deposit for my last night. Usually there are two cashiers, two runners, baggers, and a dishwasher, or at least three people in the kitchen, plus a shift leader, me. My last night, the manager scheduled the two cashiers, 
two runners slash baggers, and the dishwasher. However, only scheduled one kitchen worker and me. I called a request online ordering be turned off, which was normally done when we occasionally had less than three kitchen workers. The manager would sometimes just cut it off when they didn't want to do a lot of work that night. However, the manager denied my request because they would get in trouble. I complained that there's no way we could do all online, dine-in, to-go, call-in, and third-party orders with one kitchen worker and me, who had to deal with customers, system problems, help in the kitchen, and supervise the other workers. The manager told me that if I needed extra help when the orders got too backed up, to call the dishwasher up to the lines to help for a minute. Hmm, good idea. I pull one of the runners into the kitchen to expo and have one of the cashiers rotate between the register and running when the runner needed help. I asked the dishwasher to come up to the line to help at about 6 and we were slammed until closing at 10. We had been 30 minutes behind on orders all night so the dishwasher did not get to any dishes that night. I go to do deposit and the dishwasher starts walking towards the three sinks full and floor full of dishes in the back. I ask what she's doing and she answers that she's going to do the dishes. I tell her that her shift was over and she could go home. She says that she doesn't want to get in trouble for the dishes. I tell her that the manager said I could call her up when I needed help and that I needed her help all night and not to worry about it. If the manager said something to say that I told her not to worry about them, what are they going to do? Fire me? She leaves. I finish deposit and leave the three sinks full and floor full of dishes and go home. Never heard a word from the manager about the dishes. I asked the dishwasher about it and she didn't get in trouble for it because it was my call to not do them. And for the record, the manager has left sinks full of dishes multiple times on the nights they closed if someone else was opening the next day. I knew the manager was opening the next day after my last shift, so payback. After trying to make my last shift a disaster out of spite, I made the manager's morning a disaster by having no dishes to open with. Would I be the jerk for reporting a conflict between me and my friend to her work? I currently live with my boyfriend, Michael, of five years. For the last one and a half months, we've also hosted a good friend of mine, Caroline, who moved due to a new job but had some problems with the rental agreement. Caroline does know my boyfriend, although not very well, as we only spend a handful of outings as a group. Now, during the first few weeks, everything was pretty okay in our home. Caroline took care of a chunk of housework, my boyfriend and I worked, and in the evening we would hang out together. Caroline and my boyfriend had very little one-on-one -on -one interaction, it was pretty much always the three of us. However, Caroline started to approach me specifically during times Michael was not around and told me, in her professional opinion, she's concerned about how Michael treats me. For context, she's a social worker that works a lot with troubled families and the like. I had no idea what she was referring to and when asking for examples, she only said, We will talk later. Well, that later was next week. My mother called me to come over for some coffee but specifically asked for Michael to not accompany me. I didn't think too much about that since mom does not approve of my relationship with Michael. Anyway, when I arrived, it was mom, my dad, a friend of Caroline, and me and Caroline, and they set up an intervention. Caroline had told them that Michael mistreats me, that I was unwilling to accept that, and that it was necessary for them to help me get out of my relationship. She brought up some examples and talked about how she sees these things all the time in her job. Her examples, however, were factually wrong, grossly overstated, and some just plain stupid. The whole thing spiraled out of control. Caroline and I got into a shouting match, with my mom supporting her. Eventually, my dad stepped into it and I left angrily. On my way home, I texted Caroline that she has three days to get out of my house. No surprise, my mom took her in the very next day. When Caroline showed up to get her stuff, she again began to talk to me about how she knows what she's talking about, how I should listen to her opinion because she's a social worker and so on. Honestly, I pretty much just ignored her. However, I was thinking if maybe I should at least give a short notice to her workplace, because if she evaluates my living situation this way, based on completely nonsensical examples, while hearkening on and on about her professionalism, I do wonder if she has also overreacted in her workplace. Edit. I really should have posted some of the things she mentioned. She, for example, thinks Michael is financially controlling. 
The reason is, he is currently back in school to get additional qualification for his job. This means he only has a small income from a mini job. However, he does have a somewhat expensive hobby. So I'm paying for about 70 to 80% of our fixed expenses at the moment. However, just a few years ago, this situation was reversed. I was in uni. He worked full time. At that time, he paid the majority of our expenses. She talked about him making me work out, even though I pretty much always complain. I'm a lazy bum, a couch potato. I hate working out or sports in general. But I specifically asked Michael to help me work out. He's a sports therapist, and this usually entails pulling my blanket away or tickling me until I get up. It is 100% playful. She talks about stealing because Michael wears my clothes sometimes. Yeah, no kidding. We literally have put together all of our clothes since we are roughly the same size. She thinks he's dumping house chores on me, despite not working full time. I cook, we share doing the dishes, I iron the laundry, Michael sucks at that, every other chore is done by him. She thinks he drinks too much because he drinks wine or beer sometimes at dinner, while I don't drink at all. One drink, maybe two to three times a week. We are in Germany. Around 80% of the population would be classified as drinking too much. Edit 2. To clarify the position of my family. My dad does not have any issue with Michael. He was concerned, of course, when Caroline invited him to the intervention, but we talked and cleared things up. My mom does not like Michael simply because we are both men and she does not approve. She has never approved of any partner I had. Usually, we try to just not talk about it. I try to not bring Michael around, unless for larger or important events. Edit 3. I'm happy that I posted here instead of making a rash decision. I will not report her. Instead, I will seek out a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Hopefully, we can figure out what exactly her reasoning was. I don't really know what will happen after that meeting, but since I do have doubts about her rather drastic change and also the involvement of my mother, it would be unreasonable to just report this. If the meeting actually happens and we have a proper talk, I might post an update on this. How I got a store manager fired for selling my property to a Karen mom. I'm 26, male, and have autism and PTSD. I'm on a few different medications for depression and migraines and have to live in Section 8 housing that I just moved into a few months ago after being on the waiting list for years. I don't like being touched or loud noises, and I certainly don't like seeing anyone take my stuff. When I moved to this city for the Section 8 housing, I'd been gifted a brand new Razor Kick scooter by a friend to get around my new area with, and I love it. It's black and made a bit sturdier than typical ones for an adult to ride and has bigger wheels. It also isn't sold in the local stores, but they have a similar looking one in the bike department. And obviously, I don't just leave it outside when I go into a store. I fold it up and put it in my cart while shopping. I look kind of twitchy, so most people leave me alone and I'm just fine with that. But touch me or take my stuff and be ready for a massive freak out. I went down the canned food aisle and started browsing the chunky soup. When I picked what I'd wanted and put the cans in the cart, I noticed my scooter was gone and there was a woman with a kid fast walking away while carrying it. I shouted after them to return my scooter, but they ignored me, so I abandoned my cart to give chase. When I caught up to the lady and the kid, I tried to take my scooter back and the kid screamed so loud my eardrums felt like they were going to pop. And the Karen mom shoved down while yelling something I didn't hear because my ears were ringing and my brain just stopped working for a moment. A manager noticed the commotion and came to see what the trouble was. I didn't even get a chance to speak when the Karen mom started calling me a creep and was demanding I be thrown out. I kept trying to explain what really happened, but the Karen just kept yelling over me. We were separated and I was made to sit in an office. The manager approached me and I asked him where my scooter was and he admonished me and said it was sold to the Karen and I shouldn't have tried to take it away from the kid when they were just trying to buy it from the store. Then he pointed out he had to give the Karen a discount just because of the situation. I understandably freaked out and told him that the Karen had taken my scooter that I came into the store with and it wasn't sold there. The manager just looked confused and I nearly broke down. Then I pulled my phone out and showed him a picture a friend had taken of me with the scooter right after I'd gotten it. The next thing I knew, he was running out of the room. And when he finally came back, he said that the Karen was long gone. I pulled my phone back out and started frantically calling the police. The manager actually tried to stop me by putting his hand over my phone and I freaked out. 
He backed off because I nearly kicked him and he was panicking and saying he'd buy me another scooter from the store. I told him that my scooter was expensive and didn't come from their store and I wanted mine back. Well, it turned out I had managed to dial 911 because the police were already listening in on the line and the operator was trying to get my attention. I just told them to send someone over because my property had been stolen. I had to wait for another hour at least while police showed up and then went through the CCTV footage. It clearly showed me entering the store with a scooter and showed the Karen and her brat taking it from my cart and the mess that followed when I tried to get it back. I wanted my scooter back and police had to find the Karen from the camera footage of the parking lot. They found her address by running her plate number they got from the camera footage and I got to ride in the back of a police car while we went to her apartment. The officer knocked on our door and I didn't hear the situation because I was still sitting in the back of the car with the windows closed. But the Karen mom looked really angry and eventually brought out the scooter after some back and forth. She practically had to wring it out of her kid's hands. I got let out of the car and they asked me if I wanted to press charges because the mother had shoved me. She looked ghost white when I said I did want to. But the Karen started crying and begging me. She said that she honestly thought it was something the store was selling and it was her kid's birthday. I yelled that didn't excuse her from stealing someone else's card, let alone from a legally disabled man. Her kid was also loudly crying and my ears were hurting again. So I said I wouldn't press charges on her if she didn't come near me or my stuff again. But I wanted something done about the manager at the store for letting this happen and I was ready to ride my scooter all the way back there. But the police convinced me that it would be better if I just went home and calmed down. I later learned on my next visit to the store a couple days later that manager was fired over what had happened because he already had a few complaints against him and didn't bother to check that the scooter wasn't one of theirs. And the store gave the Karen and her kid a replacement Razor scooter that they had in stock because she had already paid for one. But she was also banned for six months from the store for shoving me and stealing my property. I was also given a $50 gift card for some free groceries since I wasn't able to buy anything the day that mess happened. Now every time I go into that store, a few of the employees know me by name. And one actually told a random kid to leave me alone when he asked about my scooter. I certainly keep a better eye on it now too. I've also since added a name tag on the underside of the scooter with my full name on it just in case this happens again. I'm building a house. A guy walks into my hotel the other day. We'll call him Jerk. Hi, I'm Jerk. I'm building a house that isn't going to be finished for a year. I need your best room and lowest rate because I'm building a house. I told him that was great. I would forward him to sales director and she could assist him. A few days later, he returns. Hi, remember me? I'm building a house. Yes, sir. I remember you. How can I help? Well, I'm checking for a year and I talked to your sales director and she told me it's okay to pay daily. Red flag number one. I proceed to listen to him tell me how great he is, how great this house is. I don't know if I mentioned it, but he's building a house, and I get him checked in. All the while curious as to how I can check in a 30-day stay. That's how we do long-term check-ins, with only one night's payment. I do it and don't say anything, all the while my new trainee, a kid, is falling right into this man's BS trap of stories and lies, and now the two are fast friends and talking at the desk, which is super annoying. The next day, Friday, was super busy. 75 check-ins with a trainee. Halfway through my night, the phone rings, and it's Mr. Jerk. Hello, I was just on the phone with your corporate office, and they issued me 60,000 credits. Our company has a reward program. I need you to apply those to tonight's payment. I politely tell him that isn't a possibility and that he could call and make a reservation starting the next day using the credits to pay for that reservation. He got very angry and told me he can't do that. He needs them to apply to this reservation because his bank, Jerk Savings and Loan, a nationally known bank with worldwide service, is currently having a network glitch where all cards are coming back declined. As he said this, I laughed out loud on the phone. I knew he had no money and knew he was going to be one of those guests who can't admit it. So I said I'm not sure what I can do. I guess you'll have to wait until they fix the glitch, because I can't issue you a new key until today is paid for. He said, That's okay, I have keys. To which I responded, Yes, but they don't work. 
I had to lock you out because we still have to receive money for tonight before I can let you back in. He responded, This is crazy. I'm building a house. The next morning arrives and he had never came back to the hotel. He finally came in complaining that he had to sleep in his car because of the glitch at his bank and that we wouldn't give him a key. He pays for the previous night and tonight, securing him till tomorrow at noon. So here we are Monday morning. I eagerly relay all this information onto my sales director who was mad that he had lied. She had never agreed to daily payment and he had never signed his contract. Normally for long-term guests, we collect a week's pay minimum in order to honor special rates. The sales director is going on and on about how he lied during the initial conversation and that she was going to not honor his rate now because he had not signed the contract in a timely manner and that he isn't going to be allowed to pay daily. She then turns back around with excitement on her face and says, Did you know he's building a house? I told her I had no idea. Then told her I did know, because he interjected it into every conversation 100 times. She then proceeds to contact Mr. Jerk in his room and let him know that because he did not sign the contract and he's having payment issues, we would no longer be able to honor the rate they had verbally agreed upon. He got very upset and said, I'm just going to have to find another place to stay. End of the whole problem, right? Not right. A few hours later, the phone rings and it's our corporate guest helpline. They have Mr. Jerk on the phone and he wants a complete refund for all his reservations for the last week because he's not satisfied. He has a laundry list full of complaints. There are kids running around unattended. His bed was not made properly. The bathroom was dirty. We won't honor the agreed upon rate. The staff is rude, etc. You can insert more complaints on your own because he probably tried it. I calmly address the guest help operator and let her know the entire scenario and the most important part, that he is building a house. She said the story she had been given was grossly different, all except for he is building a house. She mentioned he was particularly upset about the rate withdrawal. The bottom line is that he didn't sign the contract, nor did he pay in a timely manner. That gives our property all the right to nullify the offer. I couldn't deal with hearing, I'm building a house, for an entire year. I really don't even think it was true. I think that's the scam he probably runs with the property to property. He also probably gets away with it. I'm just really happy we dodged the house building bullet. Ugh, sometimes I wonder why I do this job. You are scammers. Had this lady come in who claimed she was a regular at our hotel. Recently, our management changed and the old manager had a lot of these regulars who would never have to pre-authorize their credit card and would just pay for the room at checkout. Our new GM is pretty stern about always taking pre-authorization no matter who the guest is, which is pretty fair. So this lady, let's call her Patty, comes in to check in and tells us she used to work with a previous manager and she was being nice, so we also checked her in politely while making some small talk. Then I asked her for her credit card and ID for the pre-authorization. This is when the entire expression changed and turned into a scowl. She told us she had never done that before and I politely explained to her that it's a standard process so I will need to do it and she quickly hands me her ID and credit card. I put in the pre-authorization amount and then let her know before handing the card back to her for putting in her pin. She then tells me that she doesn't remember her pin because she never uses it. So I offer to manually put in the credit card details to process the pre-authorization for her and she agrees and lets me do it for her while standing right there the entire time. We then finish the check-in and hand her the form to put in her car details, which she doesn't remember, so she goes outside to put that in and comes back. We hand her the keys and it's all good until the next day when we receive a call from her daughter yelling at us for noting down her credit card pin in our notebook. This confused the heck out of me because I vividly remember what happened and explained to her daughter that her mom didn't even know her pin, so there was no way for us to note it down if she didn't have it in the first place. I also explained to her that I manually entered the details into the credit card machine and her mom was there the entire time, so there's no way for me to have written it anywhere in a notebook, so that wasn't true. She then continued yelling, saying that this is ridiculous and we are just trying to scam her. This incident happened a month ago and the guest leaves a review on our website yesterday stating we noted down her pin, which she didn't even know, and scammed her. Oh well, I guess we are magicians because we can put in her pin even though she herself didn't know what it was. 
That is it guys, have a wonderful shift and stay away from scammers. Am I the jerk for not kicking out my nephew to let my sister move in? I, 35 male, own my house. The layout of the house is important. The basement is a mother-in-law's suite, a medium bedroom, a living area, and a small kitchenette, along with its own full bathroom. It has its own entrance. The first floor is the kitchen, dining room, and a great room, powder room, and a mud room connecting to the garage. The upstairs is the master bedroom with a master bath and massive walk-in closet. There are two more bedrooms along with a bathroom and a laundry area. One of the bedrooms upstairs I have turned into my office. I'm currently working from home full time. In April, my nephew Alec, male 20, came home from college because of current events. Alec is the oldest of six kids and my sister, female 37, has a bad habit of making him take care of all of his younger siblings. He reached out to me and I let him move into the mother-in-law suite. He's been living with me since then and we have had no issues. He does not pay rent, nor do I want him to. A couple of weeks ago, my youngest sister, 29 female, came over. She and her husband are having financial problems since her husband lost his job. She has two kids, one who's six and one who's four. She asked if they could move in with me for a while. I told her that I didn't think it would work because I only have one empty bedroom and I don't think that four people would fit very well. She said that she figured she and her family would move into the mother-in-law suite in the basement. I told her no, that was my nephew's area. Well, she started throwing a fit about that, about how she needed room and he didn't. I didn't budge. I knew what was coming next, so I spoke with Alec, telling him what his aunt was asking and telling him it was his decision whether or not to give up his space. Sure enough, she went to talk to him and he told her he didn't want to move upstairs. She started ranting about what an entitled jerk he was and more. I should say that my youngest sister, let's call her Anne, has always been jealous of Alec. His mom was just 17 when she had him, so of course she was still living at home. Anne was the baby of the family until he was born. She was jealous of him since the day he was born. After she calmed down, she said, fine, they would take my bedroom, using the walk-in closet as a bedroom for the kids. I said no to that and also to giving up my office. Well, she started ranting about how I never help her and basically just yelled at me. I told her that I was not throwing Alec out of what we both think of his space for her. Anne stormed out and started complaining to our family. My oldest sister, Alec's mom, thinks that Alec should move back with her and Anne should get the mother-in-law suite. My mom agrees with her. I told them all that they don't get to vote on what happens with my house. Now they're all saying that Alec and I are both jerks for not helping Anne. I think they're ridiculous, but I thought I would post here for outside opinions. Am I the jerk? My girlfriend is demanding an expensive engagement ring that I don't want to pay for. I, 26 male, have been with my girlfriend, 26 female, for 4 years and we've recently been talking more and more about marriage. Although my girlfriend grew up relatively well off, for the time I've known her, she's been pretty low maintenance. She's never cared about designer brands, rarely buys new clothes, and the jewelry she owns was gifted to her. I have a decent job now, 80k a year, and I've been saving for a while, but growing up, my family didn't have a lot of money. My girlfriend and I have always seemed to be on the same page when it comes to saving money. I assumed she would be fine with a more affordable ring. When I started looking into rings, I discovered Mossonite rings, which look similar to diamond rings, but are much more affordable. I was looking at rings in the $1,500 to $1,800 range. When I mentioned this to her, she insisted she wanted a real diamond ring and sent me links to a bunch of diamond rings that she liked. The prices ranged from $6,500 to $10,000. I told her that I wasn't willing to spend that much. She seemed genuinely mad and said it wasn't that expensive. We got in a pretty big argument over it. I told her that it was ridiculous to ask me to spend that much and that I thought she was more reasonable than that. She said I was being cheap and that I could afford it and that I was basically saying she wasn't worth it. I told her no one is worth a $10,000 ring. Eventually, my girlfriend said she didn't care and that I should get whatever ring I want, but she's clearly still mad, and I know this is going to be an ongoing argument. I'm a bit frustrated because this seems out of left field. I've always known marriage is super important to her, but I didn't realize she'd insist on a diamond ring. So I talked to her older sister about it, who despite agreeing diamond rings were stupidly priced, sided with my girlfriend and said if I could afford it, she didn't see the big deal. She added that my girlfriend has done so much for me 
and I was being a jerk about this. What my sister means by girlfriend doing so much for me is that she was really supportive when I was in a serious accident four years ago. I broke multiple bones and required a few surgeries. Although where I live, most healthcare is covered, I was unable to work for a while and had expenses I wasn't able to pay. I'd been dating my girlfriend for only six months at the time and she was really there for me. I couldn't pay my rent, so she let me move in with her for free and helped pay for a few expenses and for physical therapy I needed. She also helped me get a job with her uncle who was the VP of an insurance company. It was an entry level position and I had a business degree, so it's not like I was unqualified. Obviously, I thanked her for all she did for me, but it's not something we talk about much. I don't think I'm obligated to buy an expensive ring because she helped me out a few years ago. But if my own sister said this, I'm guessing my girlfriend must feel this way as well. Am I the jerk here? Edit. This post got way more attention than I expected. I've definitely reconsidered my stance. I'm going to talk to her more about this. Thanks for all your help. Well, who do you agree with? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. There's no better way to show someone you love them than by giving $10,000 to the billionaires who run the blood diamond industry. Robber mistakes me, the cashier, as a customer, offers to cut me in on robbery. I'm a convenience store cashier, and besides the occasional robbery, nothing really happens here. We've had a handful of super dramatic, get on the ground robberies, but most are just regular shoplifters. Because nothing really happens here, I like to make small talk with the people in the store to pass the time. Sometimes people have great stories, sometimes we end up knowing someone in common, sometimes it's just nice to make a person smile. The other day I was out from behind the register stocking shelves. I was the only person in the store because weekday afternoons are usually slow and because basically everyone's quit. It's getting cold here and the building still hasn't turned the heat on, so I had a hoodie over my uniform, short sleeve shirt and name tag, so I guess I just looked like a guy browsing the aisles. But it wasn't a problem because when a customer came in I'd say, let me know if you need anything and that cleared it up. Maybe two came in the entire start of my shift. Just as things were wrapping up and I've had a long dead streak, a guy about my age came in and seemed in a great mood. He also had a big hoodie, but it's cold out so I didn't think anything of it at all. I said, let me know if you need anything, from down where I was with the shelves. And he came and stood by me, kind of giggling. Weird, but I've seen weirder. Whatever. Finally I said, can I help you? And he just goes, <laughs> hey. So I'm like, Hi, and he starts talking to me about the logo on my hoodie, local sports team. And we go back and forth a bit. My side of the conversation was normal. His side was really overstated. In hindsight, it's because he was nervous. But I was kind of checked out and didn't really care at the time. Like, I'd say, he's got a good arm, but his head just isn't in it this season. And the guy would reply, Oh my god, the best arm, once in a lifetime talent. But he's not there at all, gone, trash. Garbage. They should just cut him. I keep stalking the shelves, not thinking at all about the odd nature of what he's saying, and instead thinking in the back of my mind, is he going to buy something or what? From there, we actually got to talking about how we got into the game and had a really heartfelt conversation about going with our fathers and sitting in the cheap seats and did actually sort of bond a little. Finally, we run out of sports commentary to make it one another though, so there was a wave of a silence for a few minutes. Then he gets uncomfortably close to me and whispers, I like you a lot, you know that? So my first thought was that this guy was hitting on me. No problem at all if that's what you're into. It's not my scene though, so I took a healthy step back and told him thanks, but no thanks. He laughed kind of maniacally and explained to me, no, he meant he liked me, so he'd be willing to cut me in on what he was currently doing. I ask what that is. He explains, ain't nobody in here. I've got my truck outside. I'm gonna load it up with beer and crap. You seem like a good dude, so I'm tipping you off in case you want anything. Ain't no one here. It's easy money, bro. I couldn't believe it. He was trying to rob the store, and he was telling me about it. I quickly realized his overly excited, socially inappropriate behavior must have been something he was on. Rather than confront someone that's on something, in my experience, their moods can change from perky to violent really quickly. I just went with my gut and decided to play along. I knew I needed an excuse to get back behind the register, so I said, Good crap! Forget the beer though, man. I'm going for the real easy money. And I hopped over behind the counter. 
where I promptly, but discreetly, pressed the button that locks the doors from the inside, followed shortly by our brand new panic button. First time I'd ever used it. Hoping there wouldn't be a time, but at least I wasn't genuinely panicking yet. At this point, he's loaded both shoulders up with six packs and headed for the door to make the first of what I'm sure he anticipated would be several trips. He pushed against the door with his hip and of course it didn't budge. And he pushed pretty hard, anticipating it would swing easily, so I kind of felt bad seeing him wins. He nearly dropped the beer. He turned to me, more frustrated than scared at this point, and went, Bruh, the door is jammed. Can you give it a try? I was nervous to step out from behind the register in case this guy had a weapon, so tried to deflect and was just like, Maybe you've got to pull it. He started freaking out and was running around the store. He was trying the back door, but it locked as well. He was trying to climb up and reach the one tiny window we've got, but not only was it too high, it doesn't really fit a person. I kept playing dumb. Eventually the cops came, took a while, and the guy had resorted to hiding in the stock room by the time they made it over. Not before first wrecking a couple aisles in his frenzy, but at least I was able to lock him in the stock room once he went inside. They came in to arrest the guy, and he starts trying to blame the whole thing on me, saying I set him up saying I made him do it. It genuinely confused the police for a bit. So, I don't work here as a robber. I do work at the gas station. Though, how much longer will depend on how many robberies I live down. Fill out a health and wellness survey of every shift after losing most of our benefits? Sure, boss. After reading a story about the boss that calls the worker off the clock to berate them made me think of my petty little story with my company. Like many other companies, our leadership recently released news of upcoming changes that even though profits for our company are up, they are eliminating most of the remaining perks that are still standing. Company supplied phones for anyone except the tops of the departments, gone. Reimbursements for things like safety shoes, eyeglasses for those of us in the metals and fabrication area, gone. All 401k matches, merit increases, and or bonuses frozen until figures reflect pre-lockdown levels, i.e., much larger profit margins, even though workload has increased. Our direct area has had a few manpower losses due to a few folks deciding to retire and a few that decided to pursue work from home opportunities, hiring freeze to replace anyone. All of this while the majority of the higher ups and anyone who works with a computer and argued they can work from home are, you know, working from home, which in our eyes is essentially a substantial raise or savings for those lucky individuals that can work from home fuel, daycare, etc. With the cases on the rise again, they decided to implement a health and wellness screening that must be completed every shift within 24 hours to the start of that shift and presented at the security checkpoint. There is even a nice link to where you can complete it on your own phone via an app for our convenience. Already annoyed at the above mentioned cuts, and now they are wanting me to use my personal phone and data to complete a survey before working hours. I read the requirements again. It just has to be within 24 hours to the start of the shift and presented at the security checkpoint. We were working on average between 12 and 14 hour days, so I was easily able to complete and print a physical copy of the survey at the end of the day for the following day's requirement. The next day I showed up to security and gave them the paper. She just kind of looked at it and asked what it was. Told her it was the wellness screening so I can enter the building for my shift. She replied, Oh, well, it has to be done before your shift. This has yesterday's date on it. I pointed at the disclaimer that said it just had to be within 24 hours to the start of the shift, which it was. Which, to her defense, is kind of silly, because a lot can happen between your day prior and the start of the new shift. Looking slightly annoyed, she said, Oh, okay, you can just use your phone going forward so you don't have to print it out. Thanked her and said it was actually easier for me to just do it at the end of my shift so I didn't have to think about it in the morning, especially since I didn't have access to Wi-Fi until I was already past the security checkpoint. Third morning, I did the same thing. She rolled her eyes and put the paper to the side. Didn't realize it at the time, but I was informed afterwards if we didn't use the app version, it didn't have a digital record, so they had to save all physical papers in a folder and retain them in their office. The fourth morning, the head of security was at the door and as soon as I showed the paper, he asked why I was choosing to do the physical paper instead of the app. Didn't want to get too in-depth, but told him it was easier for me to print it out at the end of the prior workday, and these guys do not pay my phone bill. 
so I was not going to use my personal phone and data to do a redundant survey off the clock every morning. He tried to argue the paper option was really only for the plants and not for the offices, and I was the only person printing them out in lieu of using the app. Told him I did not see where it said plant use only on the form, and if that was the case, HR would need to update the verbiage. A couple of coworkers in the area caught part of the interaction and how the guy was complaining to my boss as soon as he hit the door about 10 minutes later. I filled them in on what I was doing and they decided to follow suit. All 15 of us completed the survey at the end of the day to bring in the following morning. Friday morning arrives. I'm sitting in my car watching as a line forms and everyone has a paper in their hand. Can make out security guard's face. She looks ticked off. Finally get out and go to walk in. Big grin on my face and say good morning. She doesn't say a word, just does the temperature check and snatches the paper out of my hand. Around first break, I see our HR rep walk into the shop and talk to my boss. He looks over at me and points in my direction. Oh boy. And she walks over and introduces herself. We'll call her HRQB because she looks like she can play for a minor league. HR. Good morning. I'm HRQB with Human Resources. We received a call from the head of security and they're saying that you're giving them printouts of the new health surveys. Do you need help with setting up the app? Petty me. Oh no, that's not necessary. I actually already told him it's easier for me to do it at the end of my shift the day prior instead of doing it on my personal phone in the morning. I don't get very good reception here until I'm on the Wi-Fi and that's past security. HR Well, you don't need to be on the Wi-Fi here to complete the survey on the app. You can even do it at home before leaving for work and take a screenshot of the confirmation. That way, you won't have to waste paper and the security team member at the door won't have to keep it in a folder and drop it off at the office every day. It will save a lot of time and energy. Petty me. Ah, well, unfortunately, the company has taken away all of the company-issued phones except for select individuals, and I'm not going to do the survey on my personal phone or during non-work hours. I agree, doing this survey every single day is a bit redundant and wasteful, but it isn't my paper, and proof is required for me to enter the building. While it is tedious, I'm pretty sure that security is on their phone for 7 out of 8 hours that they are stationed at the door. Think they can take 2 minutes to walk down the hall to drop off the papers at the office. Pretty sure I could have poked the vein on the side of her head and caused a stroke. I thanked her for her time, and my team lead came to pull me to help him with a job slash save me. The first few days of the following week, most of my coworkers kept printing out the physical copies, which I thought was hilarious, but it was pretty short-lived. HR must have worked harder than she had ever worked in her life, because wouldn't you know it, come that following week, an email came out with a link to a new survey that only had to be completed one time online. And if after that at any point you had flu-like symptoms, or were around anyone that was sick, they held you to the honor system to report it to supervision slash HR. Can't you just take this subway to your destination? So to set the stage, I live in Istanbul, and us Turks are known for our bad city planning, but Istanbul is extra infamous for it. It's regular for us natives of the city to endure complaints about how bad the traffic is, how awfully structured the roads are, and how long it takes to get to literally anywhere, yada yada, from our friends who come from other parts of Anatolia to work or study here. I just want to get the point across for foreigners about how bad Istanbul traffic and road structure is. If you have a car, it is legit normal to have a two-hour commute home at the very least during rush hour. Anyways, so at my work, they provide a service bus because our building is in the outskirts of Istanbul where they haven't connected a lot of public transportation yet. This is also a common occurrence for us corporate slave folks of Istanbul. Big companies like these are usually located away from the central parts of the city and people who live close by take the same service bus. And the bus is pretty crowded. About 20 people who all live close by towns to each other. Like I said, I want you to understand how bad the city planning is. To get to these central parts of the city from our building and the outskirts would take no longer than 30 minutes, but traveling between the towns and dropping everyone off is the rest of the one and a half hours. So a Karen joined our bus the other day, and she lived in Taksim apparently which is a very famous town and is literally connected to every bus, minibus, subway, etc. imaginable. Even you foreigners might have heard of it. She's the only one out of 20 people who lives there. So the bus driver asks her if he can drop her off at a public transportation station that connects to Taksim. 
which would literally be any station in the entire city. But she refuses and also complains about the bus driver all the way to the higher ups of the company. And the bus driver gets scolded and disciplined and was told to drop her off at the exact location she wanted to be dropped off at. Cue malicious compliance. Next day, the bus driver replans the route, keeping Taksim in mind. She's right about in the middle of the drop off order. And I kid you not, it legit takes just an extra two hours in traffic just to reach to Taksim. That is without including dropping off other people or reaching the city center, mind you. And of course, once you set the route as it is, since it's impossible to get out of traffic, she can't tell the bus driver she changed her mind and to go somewhere else. She can't get off the bus too. She has to wait with everyone else or she might be in trouble at work the next day if she hops off at this point. Tired workers are even more tired now and also upset because they didn't want to suffer in Istanbul traffic any more than they already had to. Bus driver insists on dropping her right in front of her doorstep. She finally gets off the bus and everyone is giving her the stink eye because while she did get off, the rest are going to have to wait in more traffic to get out of taxi now. All in all, she wasted at least three hours out of everyone's time, including hers. Probably more out of people who were going to be dropped off after her. She now asks to be dropped off at a minibus station at somebody else's drop-off stop. Never complained about it ever again. Am I the jerk for RSVPing no in person to my friend's wedding? Brett is a casual friend of mine. We became friends through other mutual friends and will occasionally grab a beer during lunch but won't really hang out together unless it's an involved bigger group activity, like bowling. He's a nice guy, likes good music, and the Yankees, but isn't weird about it since he knows I don't know crap about baseball. Anyway, last year, my significant other and I were invited to his wedding and got a save the date in the mail. Due to lockdown, the wedding was postponed and they had to reschedule for this year. They sent out revised save the dates and the wedding falls on a weekend that my significant other and I are planning to move. We couldn't do it any other weekend, and since Brett is only a casual friend, I figured he wouldn't be heartbroken if we couldn't make it to his big day, especially considering the circumstances. Moving is very stressful. At some point, they mailed us an RSVP, but the house is in such chaos right now, I'm almost positive I threw it away by accident. I figured it was no big deal. I was meeting Brett for lunch anyway. This was last week and I just let him know in person that we weren't able to make it, but we'd still get him a gift off his wedding registry. I was aiming for the KitchenAid toaster. Brett and I met for a beer, and it was a good lunch. We chatted about work and video games, etc., and of course, the topic of the wedding came up. He asked me if I got my RSVP, and I told him we received it. I explained the situation and said it was unavoidable, but we were going to be moving that weekend and wouldn't be able to make it. He seemed only mildly disappointed, but totally understood. But then, that's where the problem came up. He asked me to just mail back in the RSVP with no in the box. I asked why, since I was telling him in person. He was insistent that I send him back a physical copy. I asked if I could just text him a reminder so he could write it down. He said he gets a lot of texts per day. I asked, maybe an email reminder. He refused. Said he gets a lot of work emails. Me. Why do I need to mail back the card? I just told you I'm not coming. Brett. I'll forget. The cards are the only way for me to keep track. Me. Well, I may have already thrown it out. Brett. What? Why? Me. I knew we were meeting. And, well, I'm pretty sure it didn't have prepaid postage. Brett. Oh, so that's it, huh? Can't spare the extra 47 cents? Me. It's 2021. Who even has stamps? I'd need to find out where a post office is. Then do I walk? Take an Uber? And once I'm there, do I buy a single stamp or a full sheet? Maybe one of those rules. It's all just too much. Brett. Maybe it's better that you don't come. Me. I wasn't coming anyway. I offered to write down my RSVP on a napkin for him, but the lunch was pretty much over. I'm still getting him a toaster. Am I the jerk? Edit. Not that it really matters, but Brett is still getting an $80 toaster out of this. Edit too. Call me a jerk all you want, but maybe take a breath and relax before writing me a surprisingly lengthy DM describing how you're going to get me over something you read on the internet. Am I the jerk for making my niece follow the same rules as my son in my house? My family, myself, wife, and son are neighbors with my in-laws, sister-in-law, husband, and two daughters. 
Recently, my wife and her sister have been setting up playdates between our son and their youngest daughter at our place as part of childhood socialization. In addition, they are similar in age, five and six. I was a little apprehensive at first, given that they have vastly different parenting methods, like heavy screen time to coax their kids into eating and letting their domestic helpers clean up extensively after them. We have a helper ourselves, but we instruct her to guide our son into cleaning up his toys and food mess rather than spoon feeding him. Their eldest daughter, who is 12, is a recurring reminder to me not to parent our son that way as I find her to be an extremely spoiled brat. During one of these playdates, I was at home and I saw that after they finished playing with a set of toys, she, my son's cousin, moved on to another set without putting them away. My son was in the process of putting these toys away when she told him to leave it and come over. I stepped in at this point and told both of them they would have to pick up their toys before moving on to another set. She told me that the helper would help them clean up and refused to do so. I said if that was the case, playtime was over. She ignored me and went ahead with the next set of toys, which I then took away from her and got her out of the playroom. I told her that if she wanted to continue playing, she needed to apologize and keep the first set of toys. She kicked up a fuss and started bawling and I sent her back to her place. A few hours later, my sister-in-law came down and demanded to know why I was being so mean to her daughter. I explained my stance and she insisted that I could have just let our helper clean up just this once. Our son is at a very impressionable age, so I absolutely refused to budge on this in our own home. She then said that they could send their helper with their daughter to clean up after her if that was going to be such a problem. And I also found out that for the previous playdates, our helper simply cleaned up after them. I said that I do not want them to send their daughter over again, and she told me that I was sticking my nose in their parenting affairs. I told her that it was none of my business, but once they step foot into my house, it's my rules. My wife is on the fence about this. On one hand, she thinks that we have to stick to our principles, but wonders if it was worth souring a relationship over what seems like a trivial incident. Am I the jerk for putting my foot down? No, you're a good dad. Don't let any of these entitled fools corrupt you. Am I the jerk for not giving away my cat? I volunteer fostering cats. My cats tend to go to a cat cafe, so I don't typically do meet and greets, but when I do, I'll have people stop by so they can see the cat in its territory and get a good sense for the cat's personality. A mom and her four-year-old daughter stopped by to meet one of the kittens. She applied online and went through the foster organization, so I didn't know her, but my husband was home, so I felt pretty safe. I have four cats of my own, and for this meet and greet, I shut them in my guest room just to make things easier. They're not huge fans of kids anyway. Everything was going great. They met and liked the kitten, and when we were walking back to the entrance, we passed the guest room, and the four-year-old heard my cats meowing. So she sprinted to the door and opened it before I realized what was happening. The cats scattered, except for my gray one. He's an adorable boy, with a half-milk mustache and little mittens. She fell in love immediately and ran to him and started yelling that she wanted this one because it was the same as a stuffed animal she has. The mom asked me how much it was for him and I politely said he wasn't for adoption. She kept arguing with me trying to get that cat, but like I said, he's my cat. The four-year-old started shrieking because she couldn't have the cat and she picked him up. I asked her to put him down, but she's four. She started squeezing him and he was trying to get away, but so far hadn't used his nails. He's such a good boy. The mom made no moves to intervene, and I tried to take the cat without touching her, but I didn't want to play tug of war and him end up getting hurt. So I, as gently as I could, tried to pull her arms apart, and the mom came at me, screaming not to do this. The cat got away, and the whole way to their car, they kept screaming about how I was a terrible person, and I shouldn't have showed them a cat they can't have. The four-year-old was bawling uncontrollably. It was horrible. I felt horrible. The mom threatened to call the cops and my foster organization. My husband was asleep because he works third shift, so he only caught the tail end of it. He obviously doesn't think I was the jerk because giving up our cat was never an option. I called some friends and family, and while everyone is shocked, they said I was definitely the jerk for having to put my hands on them. They said my cat could handle himself, but I was worried about her getting scratched or being bitten, and my cat shouldn't be subjected to being squeezed like it's a stuffed animal. But my sister-in-law and mother-in-law both said I should have just given them the cat if it meant that much to the kid. The cat would be their only cat while he's one of my four, and the cat would be happier with them too and made me feel terrible for causing all the drama.
They said kittens are easier to adopt, so adult cats should be given to whoever wants them. But it's my cat. I want him. They're all well taken care of and we love them very much. Update. My foster organization will not be adopting out to this family and will communicate with other cat adoption orgs in the area. I feel bad for limiting families that will adopt cats because of the overpopulation of cats, but I never want to see a cat be mistreated or adopted and then thrown to the side. Adult cats should be just as valued as kittens in my opinion. Am I the jerk for not babysitting for my sister-in-law anymore after she called the police on me? My sister-in-law and I have an agreement. She watches my kids three days a week and I watch hers three days a week. This agreement has stood since March of 2020 without issues. Any changes have been discussed weeks in advance. A couple of weeks ago, we had an argument. The next day, I brought my kids to her house, dropped them off, and left. I didn't speak to my sister-in-law because when one of us is in a rush, like I was, it's standard for us to just let the kids out, stay in the car, and drive off when you see the door open. I drove to work about 40 minutes away. When I got there, I had about 20 missed calls and even more texts, all from my sister-in-law, all saying she didn't want to watch the kids given our argument. Her first text arrived a little before I got to her place, but I didn't see it until I got to work because my phone is always on silent when I drive. I rang her, said I'll arrange to work from home, then come get the kids. She said I have 45 minutes to get back to her place or she would call the police. I told my supervisor the situation and she said I could leave after I did a few things. This delayed me 20 minutes. When I got back to my sister-in-law's, just over an hour later, she said she had already called the police when the 45 minutes ran out. I then had to stick around long enough to tell the officer that I didn't abandon them. There was just a communication issue. Sister-in-law and I had another shouting match later over this. I arranged other childcare for my kids and I've been mostly ignoring her since. However, she reached out and apologized and asked if I'd be willing to go back to the old arrangement. I told her to go buzz off. Having something like this on my record, I would never be able to work in my field again, which she knew, and her calling the police was a massive overreaction. So if she needs a babysitter, she can go whistle for all I care. She said that if I checked my phone, talked to her that morning, or came back when I was supposed to, she would not have needed to call the police. And I did this to myself, as she gave me a warning with that first text, and I could have checked my phone or spoken to her directly when I got to her place. All of which she says she would have done if she were in my position, given that we had argued the night before. I told her that if she thinks I'm babysitting for her, she's delusional and she's on her own. Because of my refusal, it's looking like she may have to quit her job because my brother and her would pay more for a babysitter than they would earn from her working. My mother and brother have both called me a jerk because there were no consequences to her calling the police and that while she overreacted, she's apologized. So if I really forgive her, I'll let us move on. This income loss would also mean that she, my brother, and my niece and nephew might need to move somewhere cheaper, that my brother might have to take on extra hours at work, and in an extreme scenario, they may even be completely unable to live independently, meaning they'd have to move in with her parents, who live several hours away. Am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her sister-in-law? Please let us know. The best thing you can do with Karens is cut them out of your life, sister-in-law or not. She made her bed, now she gets to lie in it. My Karen sister-in-law thinks she can kick me out of my own beach house. 12 years ago, our grandparents passed, leaving their beach house to me, 37 female, and my brother, 35 male. The place is within drivable distance of my town. My work is such that I can do it remotely a lot of the time. I now have two small kids. Because of these factors, through the years, I've been in the beach house much more, basically summering it in, while my brother, who lives much more distant, only crashes occasionally or requests it for a couple of weeks while I often used it through the winter. My brother is now married to my sister-in-law, 25 female. My sister-in-law has very specific ideas of what their new married life will be like. Pinterest board, custom hashtag for social media, affirmations posted around the house. The beach house features prominently in it. Despite their having to drive four hours to get to it, she insists we should divide time equally and leave it free if they want it, and that she may well redecorate to make it more hers. I have redecorated that house to suit me. I asked my brother for no money except for structural issues. There are three bedrooms, so there are no reasons we couldn't be there together. My brother literally told me he 
wasn't there enough to care about swapping use of the main bedroom, which is the only seafront one, and in which my husband has built our bed. She wants that particularly, claiming it would be their perfect love nest. I think it's my bedroom, and while she's welcome to my brother's, she can't have mine as well. We had established how to work it. I've built my patterns around it, and I don't want to change it now. She says she can't be there while we're there because it would ruin the feeling of retreat. My brother is happy with whatever she's happy with, but I know very well determined opposition on my part will make him back down. The last discussion we had about it, when I pointedly asked, would she like to live, laugh, love on the kitchen table? He winced and left the room. So if I want to hold on to the house on my terms, I can. But does it make me the jerk? To be clear, I don't object to their being here more. I don't object to their having more alone time. I don't object to their redecorating their room or bathroom, however. I don't object to their bringing some things in. But I object to having to swap my room after 12 years, having her overhaul spaces I redecorated and spent money on, and agreeing to a rigid 50-50 schedule when I already know my brother's CBA with regular long drives. ETA. You guys, I'm totally fine with being called the jerk. But I find it hilarious that people here think my brother is an unfortunate and bullied soul. He left our hometown to strike out on his chosen career. He did wonderfully. He bought a house before me and my husband did. He adores traveling abroad, and until he met sister-in-law, he wasn't keen on romantic commitment. I'd spent weekends pottering about the house, and he'd fly back to Bangkok to hike. And that was wonderful for both of us. The issue here is that he is conflict avoidant and unwilling to discuss this with me and my sister-in-law. I certainly flipped out, and I'm happy admitting it and bringing discussion back. But believe you me, he wasn't in the beach house because he was having the time of his life elsewhere. ETA 2. Right, people. I think I heard enough. I've spoken to a mortgage advisor as to how much I should offer and will discuss it with my husband reusing our savings as deposit. I will then offer to my brother when we meet up to discuss, details being firmed up. If I manage, I'll update. One thing I want to say is, it's pretty laughable to me that people so quickly assume I don't know my brother or am strong arming him or bullying him or whatever else. I got use of the house and he got someone else to maintain his private in-suite for the one to two weeks a year he wanted it. Sea view room might be best for lots, but he rather wanted to annex a bathroom and that's what he did. They also aren't airbnb this, as some of you suggested. This isn't a random vacation share, it's a well-loved family home that, with my brother's full knowledge, consent, and enjoyment of the fact that everything was clean and lovely and updated every time he came here, which was rarely, I used more and more over the years. I trust my brother to acknowledge that. As for people change when they get married, if this was my brother asking me these things, it would be different. What I got was my sister-in-law swanning in with demands and him murmuring non-committally in the background. You are all very right. I should have brought it to him first though, and that's on me. But I hardly denied his wishes, because truth is, his wishes haven't changed. They've been together two years, and his pattern of using the house hasn't changed. She just thinks it will, because now she has redone their main home, she wants another project slash Instagram backdrop. Anyway, Thanks to those of you who engaged in good faith, very much indulging all the you're the jerks who managed to speak to my relationship with the house without implying I was cheating my brother out of it. ETA 3, I thought this was clear. We both have to declare our ownership in our tax return, so this isn't a split tax, it's a separate tax each of us owes under our country's laws. My brother paid for the redoing of the bedroom he chose as his own. About eight and four years ago, we split the cost for structural repairs to part out the roof and the pipes. Absolutely everything else, the wooden porch outside, the garden, the fixtures, the kitchen, the paint job, that was me. Mortgage advisor confirmed under our country's laws, those would count towards a sizable increase in value of the property, and they would come out of his share if they were sold. Yes, I did them, but he was informed and didn't object, and at the point of sale, he would benefit. My husband agrees to using savings for deposit to buy out. Have an appointment firmed up with my brother. We'll update after. Reddit, am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or sister-in-law? Please let us know. This is why you never marry a Karen. Just ask Reddit boy over here. Am I the jerk for refusing to speak to my sister because she wouldn't let my daughter be a flower girl at her wedding? 
So I, 28 female, have a sister who's 26 who got married last month. I'm gonna be blunt. My sister has always been one of those people that has to have everything perfect to, to the point. Sometimes it was hard to be around her, but she was my little sister and I've no other siblings. So I always made excuses when she'd hurt me when I was doing things right in her eyes. I was kind of nervous when she asked me and my daughter, who's four, to be bridesmaids in February because I knew she was going to be a massive bridezilla. Over the last few months, we've had to practice multiple dances, pay for very expensive dresses, and put up with her tantrums. I told her from the start, if she was anyway nasty to my kid, I wouldn't stand for it. She assured me she'd never be nasty towards her favorite person in the whole world. Well, her now husband's little cousin, who's eight, started coming to dance practice with her mom, and my sister decided to ask her to do little things, like show my daughter how to throw the petals. I honestly thought she'd make them both flower girls for a while, but when she started to make my daughter sit out and have the other girl do her poem, I knew what was going to happen, but prayed I was wrong. I invited her out to coffee a few weeks before the wedding and asked her what was going on. She told me she was glad I brought it up because she was looking for the right time. Apparently, my four-year-old wasn't doing everything right and she was afraid she was going to mess up her version by saying the wrong thing or not doing the dance right on the day. I told her she's doing a pretty good job and everyone was always praising her. Sister giggled and said, it's not their day now, is it? So it's not up to us to figure out what's good enough for her wedding. I asked her straight up, did she think her niece wasn't good enough to be in her wedding? She replied with, not to something as big as a flower girl, but she can attend. I asked her, how was I going to break it to my daughter, who's excited about being in the wedding? She told me to figure it out. I told her I'd give her a day to rethink her decision. If not, we wouldn't be attending nor speaking to her ever again, then left. Well, two days went by, so I couldn't put it off any longer. I broke the news to my kid. Even though I tried my hardest and sugarcoated it as much as possible, the news still broke her heart. She cried herself to sleep. So did I and my husband. Well, after a week, when I was a no-show for anything, my sister started to panic and started to take every chance to talk to me and even drop off gifts for my daughter. Then I told them why a good number of our family, including bridesmaids, dropped out. We ended up going for a few weeks away with no phones. When we came back, my sister had sent me multiple letters and emails apologizing. Her in-laws and husband have called me a jerk for doing what I did. Edit. My brother-in-law saw this post and told my sister, who cried reading all your comments. How do I know? Because they showed up at my job knowing I wouldn't want to cause a scene. They begged me to delete the post before people they know see it and kept apologizing. Finally, my sister said she might be pregnant. I told her, even if she is, pregnancy doesn't wash away all the crappy things she's done and I hope her husband's siblings never treat her kid the way she treated mine because I don't plan to be a part of her life. She burst into tears, saying she was sorry and she loves my daughter. I told her to leave before I call security, and her husband tried to talk to me alone because I was making her so upset, and everyone was cold towards them because of me. I told them everyone was cold because Cinderella and Prince Charming forgot that after treating everyone like crap, that no one wanted to be in there happily ever after. They didn't like my mocking tone and raised their voice at me. My boss told them to leave, who knows the situation and has a five-year-old herself, so she's on my side. My sister's mother-in-law reached out to my parents, asking for everyone to meet up on neutral terms so we can all work out our differences. I'm gonna go to this dinner party because I wanna hear their story and officially tell them leave me alone. I will update you guys. Important edit. My sister's photographer saw this post and reached out to me on here. She knew my full name and she gave me her Instagram to confirm. This goes deeper than my daughter not dancing right. Apparently, she overheard my sister's mother-in-law and aunt-in-law talking in the bathroom. They used mean names against my daughter and husband. They called me names. The photographer said they were both drunk, but brother-in-law also made jokes around my sister earlier in the day, which she smiled at. She also thinks my family members heard it and it's the reason they dropped out. So yeah, my daughter wasn't flower girl because unlike me, her aunt or the other flower girl, she doesn't have blue eyes and blonde hair. If you're reading this, Sarah and Frank, forget you guys and your family. My kid is too good to be around jerks like you, so stay away from us. 
And if anyone in my family knew the real story and didn't tell me, forget you too. Edit 4. Thanks everyone for the love and support, but especially thank you to the photographer who came forward. Thank you so much for bringing this to my attention before I let them back into our lives. You're the real one. Edit 5. So I thought I'd answer a lot of questions that keep getting asked because I'm tired and will be going to bed soon. My parents are fully on my side. So are multiple other family members. The ones that aren't have been cut off. My daughter doesn't know the full story, but as a treat for all of us, we plan to take her to Disneyland for Christmas and my parents have said they will join us. As for my sister, some people have mentioned she might be in a dangerous relationship. Well, her husband is from old money and his family is very well connected in England, which is something she always wanted. So I don't know, but if she is in a bad relationship and afraid, it's up to my husband to forgive her, not me. I found out three family members knew, including a bridesmaid that dropped out knew. I've seen a lot of people making fun of the fact me and my husband cried ourselves to sleep the night my daughter found out. We didn't cry about her not being a flower girl, nor did we cry while she was awake. We cried because our child was extremely hurt, and there's no worse feeling than your kid thinking they're not good enough for someone they love. For the commenter who was extremely nasty about my husband crying, a father's love is equal to a mother's. Men do and are allowed to have emotions. Do better. There's a dog show in town and one of the guests has been lying and complaining all day. We didn't have the dog show last year and I didn't know it was happening this year, so it was quite a surprise to get to work and see our entire hotel is booked. In fact, we were overbooked for single king rooms with fridge and microwave. We don't have much to begin with because lockdown smashed our planned renovations, so that is going to be a problem. A shift blocked a number of standard two beds, no fridge or microwave, to move people to, etc. In addition to our dog show guests, we have around a dozen regular people in-house who also have dogs since our brand Motel Sucks is pet friendly as we don't charge a deposit. Throughout the day, it's been like a dog war in our large grassy courtyard with dogs barking at each other and whatnot. My manager's apartment is in that area and she was calling me throughout the day because some of these dog owners weren't cleaning up after their dogs despite signing our pet policy. So around 5 p.m. or so, Dog Crab Show checks in and has attitude from the beginning. While not a proper Karen, she still was a headache to deal with. She is a horrible guest. Karen, I have a smoking room reservation under my name. Me, I apologize, but we do not have smoking rooms. Our entire hotel is non-smoking. Karen, oh, really? Then why was I promised a smoking room by the lady I spoke with? Me, I see you booked through a third party, and unfortunately, it seems they weren't aware of our hotel smoking policy. Something about her attitude made me think she knew full well that more than likely, we don't have smoking rooms. I don't know any hotel in town that does, actually, and I think that's the case in the majority of hotels. Okay? Well, that's fine, I guess. I'm also an AARP member. What discount do I get for that? Me. This is an OTA third-party prepaid virtual card reservation, and I cannot alter their rates at all. I apologize. Well, I was told you could apply the discount in person when I check in, and you're telling me you can't? Me. These types of reservations are prepaid, and I cannot alter that in any way. So again, I'm sorry, but the person you spoke to may not be aware of that. Karen. Okay, fine. I'll speak to someone else in the morning who knows what they're doing. What else do you need? Me. I need a photo ID, credit card, or cash, please. Okay, here you go. And I hope you have something on the ground level. And of course, I do not, so I prepare to get more attitude. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am. For that room type, two-bed deluxe room with fridge and microwave, we are completely sold out, and the last room I have is upstairs. I assume you have elevators here? We do not, ma'am. Wow, I was told your website says you have elevators. It doesn't. How am I supposed to carry my ice chest up the stairs? There were no requests of any kind on her reservation at all, and we don't have a smoking option. Me. I can help you with that, ma'am. Never mind. If that's all you have, that's all you have. So I guess we have no choice. We'll just make do. Me. Okay. I see you have pets with you. How many? Five. Oh boy, this is more trouble. But thankfully, she said they stay in their van and don't go into the room, so dodge that bullet. 
I finally get her checked in and off they go to unload their giant van, which takes them about two hours. The dogs are there in kennels and look like expensive breeds. After they finish unloading and tucking in the dogs, she walks back in. There's something wrong with our TV. The channels are going in and out. Can we get a different room? Something on the ground level? By that time, we had nothing left except our blocked rooms. Me. Unfortunately, I do not have anything left on the ground level. But I do have a standard two-bedroom near yours that I can move you to. What do you mean by standard? That means it does not have a fridge and microwave. So, it's a downgrade. I assume that means cheaper, right? Me. Yes, there is a slight price difference. Well, that goes back on my card? No, it will not. As I explained, your rate is prepaid. And while I can move you to a standard room, what you paid will remain the same. Okay, whatever. So I move her and apparently maintenance was working on that room and no one told the desk. So that was on us and she rightly complained about that and I ended up moving her again. Since she had a legitimate complaint, she played that hand for as long as she could, recounting the utter horror of entering a room that wasn't ready to be rented out, etc. I move her and throughout the night, I got more bogus complaints from her. She called and said there were kids running around outside her room, screaming, etc. And she was worried that might upset her dogs. By chance, I was watching the cameras for a different reason and there were no kids running around. To be sure, I rewinded the tape and again, nobody was by her room at all. She called several times about a loud neighbor next to her and there was no one next to her on the other side. One room was down and the other room was one I moved her from and had to put down for the night. There was someone below her, but she was insistent it was from the people next to her. I knew she was BSing, but I listened and followed routine. In the meantime, other guests are arriving, including one of the overbooked rooms with fridge and microwave. I explained to her what happened, and she was very nice about it, but said she would need one tomorrow. I remembered I moved Karen out of a room with fridge and microwave and told the guests that I would be able to move her into her room soon. She was extremely thankful and gave me a tip then and there, even before I brought the fridge and microwave over. So I bring it over, and as I'm setting it up for her, some random dog, not a dog show dog, ran into the rooms and bit my ankle. I reminded the guest of our pet policy. All dogs need to be on a leash if they're out of the room. He was sort of upset about it, so I told him since the dog bit me, if the dog doesn't have a leash, we will need the guest to leave the property. Soon after, Karen called me again with the brilliant idea of moving the fridge and microwave from her old room to her new one. I lied and told her we cannot move fridges and microwaves from room to room, which is technically true, but something I do on occasion, as in for the nice lady from earlier in the day. Unlike Karen, her reservation did have actual requests, and I thought, what the heck, she's super nice, so I'll go ahead and do that for her. Karen didn't say anything for a few moments, then said, okay, you'll be hearing from me soon, and hung up. A few minutes later, Expedia called me and asked me to issue her a refund for the entire stay, and I refused. He then read me a list of her complaints, including that I stole her fridge and microwave and was making up policy to rob her out of what she was promised. I quickly explained the issue and said I could refund her unused nights, but she would have to pay for tonight as she used the room and will spend the night there. He tried to get me to give her a 50% discount for the night because she could settle for that. I again refused and he put me on hold for about 15 minutes as I guess Karen tried spinning more lies. He asked one more time and I said I can't do that and she agreed to move to a different room and that was all explained to her at the time and she knew what to expect. I wrote up a lengthy report for a shift then clocked out exhausted. Am I the jerk for telling my wife she embarrassed me by bringing a meal to my work? I, 33 male, recently got hired at a large company in the south where me and my wife moved months ago. My wife was excited for my new job and talked about preparing a surprise for me, which got me excited, but I didn't know what it was until she showed up at my workplace two days ago with the meal she said she prepared specifically for me since it's my favorite. Apparently, this was her surprise. I was a little upset she brought it to my workplace. My coworkers, who are vicious and brutally honest and sarcastic, got involved and kept teasing me about the meal. One of them, Austin, joked about how mommy is so supportive by bringing food to my workplace. I felt like crap as he and other coworkers kept laughing at me. 
I went to work the next day and Austin kept making jokes about me saying things like, is mommy going to bring lunch today as well? And when is mommy coming to change your diaper? And stuff like that. One of them, who's someone I don't know that well, said, Oh, you guys, I can still smell the meal OP's mom brought yesterday. She's such a great cook. Bless her heart. And the giggles kept on. I felt so awful, I went home and just blew up, telling her that she flat out embarrassed me and just torpedoed any prestige and respect I had among my coworkers. I told her what Austin and the others have been doing and asked if she was happy for giving him ammo to come at me like that. She argued that she was just trying to do something nice for me and didn't care about what people might say, but I was a selfish jerk who only cares about what others think rather than how she felt by my constant berating over a meal she put effort, money, and time into to make and bring to me. The argument escalated after I suggested that she could have waited until I got home to surprise me with the meal instead of showing up while I was working, which made me seem unprofessional. She said she came during lunch break, but I was still working during lunch break. She said at this point, I clearly find it easier to blame her than to stand up for myself against those childish bullies. I said I didn't appreciate what she said, but she replied that I should be grateful she cared enough to bring me a home-cooked meal, then thanked me for showing her it's not worth wasting any more of her time cooking for me after this. I told her to stop blaming me for something she caused and asked her to admit that maybe she should have consulted me before bringing the meal over so I could avoid being the butt of every joke my coworkers told. I don't even know how long this is going to last. She told me to man up and either report them or quit then. I was floored by what she said. I had to walk out because I couldn't take any more of this and felt like she wasn't listening to how her behavior caused me an issue at work. Edit to say that I in no way don't appreciate my wife's effort, but the only problem I have is that she didn't tell me beforehand about whether it was okay to bring the meal over to my workplace. I really preferred that she waited until I got home or we could have gone out later to eat. I agree that the main problem I have is my coworkers, but I lashed out because I felt overwhelmed with their hurtful remarks that offended my wife as well. Am I the jerk for not inviting my friends for an annual New Year's trip because they didn't invite me last year? So my friends and I have been traveling for every New Year since we were 16. We are in our early 20s now. It's a friend group of six people, three girls, three guys, and naturally, we all dated someone from the group at some point in high school. The guy I used to date and me broke up in 2020 but stayed friends. He found a new girlfriend a few months after that, let's call her Amy, but I was okay with it and we all continued to hang out. Now New Year 2021 is coming up and we start to plan our trip. We were supposed to go to Greece. Usually, I'm the one talking to the agencies and trying to save us as much money as we can. Everything is fine and going well until about a month before the trip. My ex, best friend, comes over and tells me that Amy is uncomfortable with me going on a trip because everyone is coupled up and I was single and given my history with her boyfriend, she felt awkward. I felt sorry because I never got the feeling that she didn't like me or anything. So I asked if that means that she's not coming or what. Turns out that she still wanted to come, just didn't want me there. I was kind of hurt by this, but even more when the rest of my friends agreed that maybe it would be better if I didn't come, so there would be no drama on the trip. Anyways, I didn't go. Kind of stayed away from Amy and my ex since then and stopped hanging out as much with all of them. Not long ago, Amy and ex broke up. I don't know why. And now this year's trip is coming up. I already have plans with my roommate and we're going to Amsterdam. When my friends learned about this, they just assumed they are coming with us as well. I told them that roommate and I are going alone, and if they want to go, they can plan it for themselves, but that this is not a group trip. It's petty, I know, but feels right to do to them since what they did to me. Anyways, they called me some names and we had a fight, and I'm starting to wonder if maybe I am in the wrong. I mean, I'm ending years-long friendships over some stupid trip, so am I the jerk? Edit. Wow, guys, this really blew up and is a bit overwhelming having thousands of people giving you advice. Thank you for your rewards. It's very kind, but as far as I know, they do cost money, so please don't waste it on me. Anyway, it's 1.45 a.m. and I need to sleep on all of this. I'm grabbing coffee with some of my friends tomorrow before classes, so I'll let you know how it goes. Entitled Mom thinks if my garage door is open, she and her bratty son can search for and take what they want. I've been lurking here and have been afraid to post because I'm awkward 
and don't know if my stories will be as well liked as everyone else's. So here goes. I am posting from my phone, so it might be some mistakes. The stars. We've got myself from about 16 years ago. I'm 28, so I was 14 at the time. We've got entitled mom. My neighbor from across the street, a self-entitled mother. We've got B5K, her five-year-old kid who's obsessed with other people's stuff. The scene, my garage. During the summer between 7th and 8th grade, my parents would go to work and leave me with a giant list of chores so overwhelming I wouldn't even try. Also, I live in Texas, so it would sometimes be too hot to try. One day, to avoid being crapped on, I decided I would attempt to do the chore, clean out the garage. My parents hoard crap, and they get upset when they can't find what they want. And my stepfather just buys crap and doesn't even try to put it somewhere. So it's my job to organize the garage so that my mom can actually park her car. I'm moving stuff around for a few hours and I'm sweaty and hot and all it looked like I was really doing anyway was just removing the mess. I came across my tricycle from when I was younger. I put it outside on the driveway so I can try to find a place for it later. I decide to take a break and go inside, fix some lunch. A couple minutes later, I hear rummaging in the garage and something break. I thought it was my cat. I look, it was B5K, sounds like a Star Wars droid name, searching through the place, looking around like he just found good treasure. Me, hey B5K, where's your brother? He's grounded till Monday. Me, well, you should go home and play with him. What did you break? Kid looks like he's gonna cry. Me, listen, I don't play unless your brother is there too. Please go home. So I close the door. I thought that was the end of it. I go back to my food and VH1 music videos. When I'm done, I go back outside and I notice something is missing. The tricycle is gone. I knew who took it, B5K. So I get on my bike and ride it around the block. I catch up to B5K in almost no time at all. He tried to start pedaling faster, but it's a tricycle, so it's not like you can do that. I want everyone to know this. This was no plastic thing that leans back. This was made out of metal and looked almost like a very small bike. So anyway, I yell at the kid to stop. He starts crying and ignores me. I pedal up to him and get in front of him. He rides into my bike and falls. I don't help him up, but I take my trike back. I put it inside the house and then go back outside to finish up in my garage. Now from across the street to the left, I hear B5K yelling to someone. I assumed it was his older sister. She was a year behind me and didn't usually care about the stuff he complained about. So I expected her to come over here and just give me a little crap playfully and then go home. I go back to my chore and then I feel someone prod me between my shoulder blades. I assume this to be his sister, so I turn around, ready for a pretty smile and a sarcastic chewing out. I was ill prepared for this because it was Entitled Mom in all her rage. Entitled Mom What did you steal from my son? Me Nothing my son says you took something from him while he was playing. Where is it? Me. I didn't give him a thing. He tried to steal my tricycle. Where is it? Not telling you. You could have heard him. Me. I look at her very confused. He was only playing. Give him his tricycle back. His tricycle? He got it from my garage. Well, you're too old for it. Me. Look, lady. I'm just trying to finish a job so that I don't have to worry about it. Please walk away. I pull my flip phone out of my pocket and called my mom. Entitled mom promised to have my trike back when my mother came home and picked up her little thief and left. Karen was rude to Chipotle staff, so they got hot sauce revenge. This happened today, not to me personally, but to another customer that was the next in line at the food place I was at. To set the scene, this place is much like the famous Tex-Mex food joint in the US that serves burritos, burrito bowls, etc. You know the place. There are ready-made options which come with set configuration of food items and there's also the option to build one yourself. All the options are written down on three big banners on top of where the employees make the food as standard. I order my food and I'm waiting for the next employee down the assembly line to finish my burrito with the condiments. An older woman who's carrying herself with that I am better than you attitude and who definitely looks like someone who does not enjoy fast food often and looks down on those who do, orders a vegan burrito, one of the preset choices. The employee has to ask still the type of tortilla, white or whole grain, 
and the type of rice, white rice or black rice. The woman is very lazy with her response, looking down at her phone and taking her sweet time with it. The first employee makes the burrito base and passes it to the girl down the line, for whom I am waiting to finish my burrito and who is also going to finish the woman's burrito. The woman asked if she could have any sauce with the burrito. The employee then explains that they do not put any sauce in the vegan burrito because the sauces are not vegan. She says that they do put in salsa verde, which is technically a sauce, but counts as a topping in this store, not a sauce. The woman does not reply, looks up quickly and asks for the red chipotle sauce, as there are pictures in the banner corresponding with the sauces. At this store, there are two sauces with very similar names, explosive chipotle and creamy chipotle, one being significantly more spicy than the other. The creamy sauce is orange in the photo and the explosive is red. Neither sauce is vegan as the base is male. The employee is now trying to tell the woman two things, that the sauce she's asking for isn't vegan, in case the woman is since she ordered a vegan burrito, and that the red sauce is very spicy. Now, maybe this woman knew what she was doing and she just likes the vegan burrito and can handle her spice. However, from my point of view, that was not the case. The employee says again, Ma'am, this sauce isn't vegan and it's very spicy only to be cut off by the woman who's saying with a very pushy tone, Can I please just get the sauce? I think the woman understood that the employee was not allowed to put extra sauce in the preset burrito options. You get only what's in the description. It was probably a long day for the employee and she just stood there for a brief moment with a clear face of frustration and asked, Are you sure? The woman promptly and annoyingly said, Yes, I am sure. Cue malicious compliance. The employee added the salsa verde, which is already a bit spicy, and then grabbed the squeezy thing where the explosive chipotle sauce was and gave that Karen a generous amount of zigzagging on the entire burrito. She then looked up and said with a smile, Is that going to be warm or cold? She then rang us both and the lady left. I wish to God I could have seen her face eating that burrito. Eat only in the designated area? Fine. This happened yesterday at a large regional grocery chain near me. It's the type of place with tons of gourmet and specialty departments, including ready-to-eat food and a little cafe area. The cafe includes a small gated-off outdoor space on the side of the building, which gets pretty busy as people are still hesitant to eat inside right now. There's also a hot foods bar that changes each day of the week. Yesterday being Saturday and game day, the theme was chicken wings. So I was picking up my groceries for the week, minding my own business when I'm hit with the most divine smell I've ever known. Mind you, it's a bit past noon and I haven't eaten all day. Next thing I know, I'm following the smell like a cartoon thief chasing a pie in a window. I find myself at the hot bar and, possessed by a force far greater than myself, loaded up a container of wings. I check out, now fully entranced with the aroma of buffalo sauce and knowing full well that these wings aren't going to make it home. I step outside and walk down to the end of the building and sit down on the concrete ledge under the awning and I go to town on my chicken wings. Like absolutely unhinged, raccoon out of a dumpster, chowing the heck down and not caring about anything else. Proudest moment? No. Would I do it again? Absolutely. It's bliss, until suddenly my chickeny meditation is interrupted by that deliberate type of ahem that sounds less like a polite throat clearing and more like an engine trying to turn over. I look up and see a well-dressed woman, probably mid-40s, sternly tapping her foot and pointing behind me. Confused, I look over my shoulder and see the no loitering sign. I'm still not getting it. I've obviously got a cart full of groceries and I just stepped out with them. I explain to her that I'm just enjoying my hot lunch before I head home. She is having none of it. Either eat in the designated cafe area or get out. I point out that all of the cafe tables are full and I've just got a couple more wings. She then delivers the kicker. Figure it out before I call someone to figure it out for you. Fine. I stand up, gathering my wings and leaving the rest of my groceries. I walk the 10 feet to the gated area duck between the metal railings, the gate is about 10 yards down the way, look pointedly around the occupied tables, then sit down on the concrete and continue eating my wings, looking this lady in the eye. She tuts and pulls out a cell phone, ostensibly to call someone to figure it out for me, but either it was for show or they thought that she was nuts as I did, 
because I finished my chicken wings in peace, albeit among a sea of confused patrons. Edit. I don't know whether Chick Heron worked for the supermarket or not. The more I think of it, maybe she didn't, since I don't remember seeing a badge or lanyard or anything. She was just dressed nicely. 2. Was it technically loitering? Heck, I don't know. Those signs are usually put up around here to ward off panhandlers and other down-on-their-luck individuals. Morally, it's awful, but legally, I think they can kick anyone off their property on any grounds. 3. Yes, it was a Wegmans. Good job, clever Redditor. Yes, I'll be going back. Maybe if I see her again, I'll just eat progressively more outlandish things on the sidewalk. I think they have baby back ribs on the hot bar sometimes. Entitled Mom wants to know why I got to board before her. A little bit of context before I get to the bones of the story. I, 21 female, have never flown by myself before. I was super nervous about it, so I tried to avoid every possible roadblock before I even got to the airport. Last Monday, my flight that I originally was scheduled for was canceled due to bad weather. Luckily, I was rescheduled, so my flight went from 11.30 p.m. on Monday to 8.30 a.m. on Tuesday. I wasn't super stoked to be up that early, but I was still glad that I was going home for fall break. I got through TSA okay and made it across the airport to my gate. The people at the gate looked a little grumpy, but I just chalked it up to the flight being canceled the night before. I paid to choose my own seat and for priority boarding so I could get on the plane and be done with it. I was also worried about possibly needing a seatbelt extender, so I wanted to spare myself any additional embarrassment and get it over with. I ended up not needing it. The gate agent announced that at 7.45, the boarding process would begin. Those who need assistance first, then military, and then priority boarding. A woman with her mother in a wheelchair boarded, then a nice old man in a walker and his wife, and finally, the entitled mom and her kids. Entitled mom had four teenage daughters with her, and one of them was in a wheelchair. All five of them walked up to the gate agent to board, and the following conversation ensued. Entitled mom, We are ready to pre-board. My daughter is in a wheelchair. Agent, All right, ma'am. Can I see your boarding passes? Entitled mom and her kids all show their phones to the gate agent, and he scans them. Agent, Okay, ma'am. It looks like the girl is the only one approved for pre-boarding, but I can let one of you board with her if she needs assistance. Girl, I can board on my own. I don't need help. Entitled mom. Don't be silly. She needs us to help her. She can't get seated by herself. Right, girls? Entitled mom and her other three daughters agree amongst themselves while the girl tries to sink into her chair. Entitled mom. Who will help her if we aren't on the plane? She can't get on herself. You have to let all of us board with her. Girl. I can get on myself. I don't need help. Agent. Well, ma'am. If she says she can board herself, then she can board herself. I'm sure a flight attendant can help her if she needs it. She needs us to help her. She can't do it herself. Why can't you get that? Girl, I'm 17. I can get on the plane by myself, mom. Agent, ma'am, she's insistent that she can seat herself. So I'll have a flight attendant come assist her on the ramp and you can wait until your group is called. Even if she did want your assistance, I'm sure all four of you don't have to help her. The gate agent called a flight attendant who helped the girl board. He then called for priority boarding, so I stood up, grabbed my bags, and showed the gate agent my boarding pass. Entitled Mom. Why does she get to board? She isn't disabled. This is BS. I felt my face get hot, and I started to get nervous. Agent. She paid for priority boarding. Therefore, she gets to board before everyone else. That makes no sense. I don't get to pre-board with my daughter, but she gets to board before everyone else? Agent. Ma'am, we have a belligerent passenger policy, and if I deem you a threat, you don't have to fly. That shut her up, and I boarded as fast as I could. Walking on the plane, I saw the girl sitting in the front row, quietly reading a book and listening to music. If that's how that lady acted then, I don't want to know how she acts the rest of the time. She probably was embarrassed, and I felt bad for her. I got to my seat at the middle of the plane, and towards the end of the boarding, I saw why the entitled mom and her daughters wanted to board with the girl. They were a part of the last boarding group all the way at the back of the plane. My flight went well and I had a good time at home with my family. I hope Entitled Mom and her family had a good trip too, even if she was an entitled jerk. Won't let me go home? Okay, can't make me work. The shipping company I used to work for would do crew changes in the US. The ships were on liner route 
and would eventually make it back to the United States where crew members would swap out. However, I then got a new job where the ships weren't on linear service, so usually your relief would be flown out to wherever country you are in. It usually ended up being a nightmare with schedule changes, messed up flights, etc. One colleague was severely overdue. The company sent a relief out to take his place so he could be sent home. The company also has a policy that vacancies need to be filled before overdue reliefs. However, they were waiving this for the engineer in question and sending him a relief first, then filling the vacancy later. The relief gets there and the guy does turnover, teaches them all the specifics, etc. The offgoing engineer asks, okay, when is my flight? The chief engineer tells him, oh, sorry, actually, we're not letting you go. We need to wait for the company to send a second relief because I used that guy to fill your vacancy. You need to stay here. Needless to say, the third engineer was upset. I think he had already scheduled a vacation with his family, like Disneyland or something. Anyway, the ship got underway to sea and he was still there. Around 10 a.m. one day, I went to the officer's lounge to get a cup of coffee and chill for a few minutes. I saw that guy sitting in the lounge in his pajamas watching the news. And the next day, and the next day. Instead of working, he decided to just watch TV and nap all day. He said, yeah, my relief is here. As far as I'm concerned, my job is complete. They cannot get me a flight, but they can't make me work. After a few days of this, the chief engineer actually tried to give the third engineer a disciplinary. He called him into his office and berated him. The next day, the company called the chief engineer in the middle of the night, daytime in America, and basically said, what the heck are you doing? Let him go now. The disciplinary didn't go through. He got flown off in the next port and he continued to draw overdue relief pay and salary those days he was not working. Edit. Oh yeah, I also wanted to mention that third assistant engineer was already overdue for relief. I think he was already two months over when this occurred and that this was before lockdown, so he was already supposed to be home. Then he got a name and he was told when your relief shows up, you're being flown back to your home of record. He told his wife and family that he was coming home, but then they pulled the rug out from under him at the last minute. That's not what I'm paid for? Okay then. I used to work for a chain of pubs who loved to have promotions tied up in red tape. At the point in this story, I was technically a server on minimum wage, but doing supervisor work. This had been going on for a while as the manager hadn't submitted the paperwork. In our country, if you're on minimum wage, your employer has to pay for any time you have to be available for work slash required to remain on the premises, not just if you are actively working. Manager would frequently rotate me on awful split shifts like 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m., then 5 p.m. to close, approximately midnight by the time the tills and cleaning were done. Because I was the only supervisor on shift, I was expected to remain available for those middle three hours in case I was needed for manager stuff. Now, initially, I didn't mind this so much because of the inconvenience of traveling back home to just come in again. I just chilled out with some free experiment from the kitchen and a good book in the corner of the bar. I did, however, change payroll if I was expected to jump back into action to add on however long it was. Few weeks into me doing this, the manager noticed. Manager, why are you down for 14 hours on Thursday? I scheduled you for 12.5. Me, it picked up at 3.30 and colleague was getting slammed. Manager, but why have you changed payroll? Me, because that's what I worked. But you weren't scheduled to work, you chose to. Me because you told me to be available during those hours. I'm changing it back. You get paid for what's agreed. Me, what about tomorrow then? I'm on the same split shift. You'll be paid for when you're scheduled to work. Don't change it again without my approval. All right then, have it your way. The next day, 2 p.m., I stepped off the bar, grabbed my stuff, and walked a few doors down to the local cafe. The server and the chef had my number if they needed me because I felt guilty leaving them to it but they agreed not to let on to the manager exactly where I was, just to say I'd left if he came downstairs from his flat. Server also said she would call him in the first instance if it was busy. I don't think she ever liked someone having to hang around unpaid on principle, but she was a minimum wage worker too. A warning text preempted his call, and his mood was as you could expect. I confirmed I wasn't in the building, he demanded I return. I threw the legislation in his face, and reminded him I wasn't being paid for those three hours, so I wasn't obligated to be on site. He wanted to go back to what I had been doing, but I told him that was off the table. He wants me there for three extra hours a day. 
I'm getting paid for it, even if I've got my feet up. I told him his other option was to sign the promotion paperwork, and then the law wouldn't cover me in the same way. It was signed before I got back to the bar. Not long after, I applied for a transfer. Remove our admin permissions? We will wait for the grief to come pouring down from above. This happened about 20 years ago, as I was starting my IT career. The organization I was working for was an early adopter and had just rolled out Windows 2000, and delegated control was still a good idea, a long way off being implemented. It was discussed making this happen by the sysadmins, but not implemented to allow the help desk to have granulated permissions, but this had not been worked out yet. I was still on the help desk and worked with Alec. Alec had been around since I think Noah was building the ark and possibly handed him the hammer when needed, so Alec knew everyone and had interesting stories to tell. If Alec is on here, he can tell his own stories. The computer corporation that the organization had hired to manage second and third level escalations above help desk decided that the lowly help desk peons, Alec and I, could not have domain administration permissions anymore as we were doing the work and taking cases off them. That meant they could not justify as many man hours they were charging our organization. So on Wednesday night, our accounts were removed from the elevated permissions without notifying us. Possibly our managers were notified, but not what the implications were. Here comes the compliance. See, all we could do now was catch and dispatch, nothing else. Simply take the call and log it into the help desk system, saying someone needed their account unlocked to be able to work. Someone else wanted to change their password. As they had forgotten their password, and another person needed access to a specific folder on the file servers. This is all run-of-the-mill level 1 tasks that take seconds to complete. However, not this Thursday. I see the computer corporation that day needed to do their weekly team building meeting that I was not privy to, not working for them. However, I'm sure that they were told how much extra money they would be making doing all of these extra cases. Alex started after me as he then had the later finish. So I explained our lack of access now and that we would have to simply catch and dispatch calls now, with the computer corporation doing all the work. This is boring and what gives help desk roles a really bad name. Alec wanted to go to our managers to get this changed immediately. I convinced him to comply with the corporation. We would allow the people directly affected by not being able to work to complain to their managers. Then they would complain to ours, so we don't look like we're being difficult to the computer corporation's new stance, whom we had to get along with. Oh yes, they did complain. The manager for Computer Corporation got hauled out of their team meetings to fix things up so we could do our work and our colleagues could then do theirs. When their managers asked why we did not say these cases were backing up, we replied we could not change or unlock passwords and they were busy in their meeting and we were asked previously not to disturb them. Petty, I know, but we did get our admin rights back before lunchtime. Also, now things are massively changed and domain admin rights are not handed out so fast. But this was early days of Windows 2000. Alec, you magnificent guy. Hope you're still kicking goals, and this brings back memories. I don't work there, Karen. After I retired, I took a part-time job at a tool store, mostly to get the employee discount. This store was right next door to a popular farm and ranch supply store. There was a deep overhang in front of the stores, and the other store kept large bags of animal bedding and such beneath the overhang, but only on their side. One day after my shift ended, I was hanging out in front of the store before bicycling home, talking on the phone. Karen pulls up in a nice SUV with a trailer, shoves a receipt in my face, and rudely demands I load a dozen bags of animal bedding for her. I tell her I do not work at the farm and ranch supply store, but will gladly call them to ask for help for her. Now, to be fair, the tool store and the supply store both had blue shirts, but each had the store names prominently embroidered on the front. The supply store employees were almost uncomfortably clean cut, and I had rather longish hair and a huge mustache. She starts screaming. She's in a hurry. She's almost out of gas. I'm wearing a blue shirt. Yada, yada, yada. I politely point to the name on my shirt and again say I do not work for the supply store, and it's not my job to load their products. Again, I offer to call them and ask for help for her. She storms off towards the front door to the supply store, yelling about how I should get a haircut and she's going to get me fired. I said, good luck with that lady, which really, really upset her. Her SUV was idling rather roughly this whole time. Eventually, she comes back with one of the managers of the supply store 
and an employee who loads the bags of animal bedding. The manager is trying to explain to her that no, I do not work for them and should not be loading their products. About this time, you guessed it, her SUV stops for lack of gas. She goes back inside and I see her leave with a plastic gas can and start hoofing it to the gas station a couple of blocks away. Meantime, her SUV is still switched on and her dome light is getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. I guess someone could have shut the driver's door, but I sure didn't feel like doing it. Having nothing better to do, I stayed to watch the show I knew was about to unfold. After a good hour, she staggers back with a full five-gallon can. I do not think I would have cared to carry it a couple blocks. It took her a while, but she finally figured out how to pour it into the SUV. As she was pouring it, she was screaming that this was all somehow my fault. Then she tries to start the SUV, and of course, it will not turn over. Some kindly old man stops and asks if she needs a jump and gets out his jumper cables. After a few minutes, the SUV turns over but will not start. It seems it's one of those that needs a fuse removed and the engine cranked for a while to pressurize the fuel injection lines after running out of gas. I try to tell her this, but she starts screaming at me again and called me some rather uncomplimentary names. Fine, Karen. Call AAA or a tow truck. I've used up my good deeds for the day. When a tow truck driver finally comes, the driver hooks up his jumper cables, removes the fuses, and cranks the engine for a while. He replaces the fuse and starts it, to the accompaniment of a huge cloud of smoke. He smells the gas can and it seems she had bought diesel fuel instead of gasoline. He tells her that he will need to tow the SUV and it will need the entire fuel system flushed. She screams that I should pay for it since it was still somehow my fault. With that, I headed for home on my bicycle, telling her, have a nice day. Am I the jerk for having someone's car towed with no warning? I'm 30, male, and my sister is 36, female, and three years ago, we had the opportunity to get our dad, who's 62, a house that was close to us after our mom passed. Before her passing, he used to be this funny, friendly, and happy guy who was always making jokes and was the sunshine of our lives. But with all due reasons, after my mom passed, he became sad and lonely. He cried almost every day and it hurt our hearts to see him like that. We lived in the next city for work and we begged him to please come with us. He refused at first because leaving the family home hurt him more than living in it, but after a while he agreed. He chose a small house just for him and his pets. We didn't rent him an apartment because he's just not that kind of guy. He has a 2016 Avio that he doesn't drive that much right now. But from time to time, he likes to go back to our hometown and just spend the day in the places he and my mom used to go to. Problem with this is that he can last a month or so without moving the car. He uses it more during October through December because it was my mom's favorite time of the year. And thus, his neighbors, a 25-ish married couple, use his driveway because the dude owns four cars and he doesn't have the space. My dad doesn't have that much of a problem since he leaves his car in the garage and told me that whenever he needs to get it out, he just calls the girl and she moves the other one. Until a few months ago, when apparently the girl was nowhere to be found and the guy is home all day. He had asked him a few times to please move the car and the dude just says, yeah, sure, and takes an hour or two to do so. And my dad can't drive it because it's already too dark for him to see. Yesterday, I went to visit him and he wanted to take me to see some sports cars. I don't know, man, he's like a kid that he found next to a park like those public car shows. I'm not sure. He wanted to drive his car, but the neighbor had his car in dad's driveway, so he went to ask him to please move it. He said yes, but after 30 minutes of not seeing him, my dad explained to me the above, and I said, no problem, and got someone to tow it. The dude obviously freaked out when he saw what was happening and asked what the heck I was doing. Apparently, the dude doesn't have the right documentation for the car and can't get it back because he doesn't have the money. He's calling me a jerk, and while my dad doesn't agree with him, he doesn't agree with me too. But man, my dad was doing him a favor and he acted like an entitled jerk. However, if I was wrong in my actions, I'm willing to say sorry and get him his car back. Am I the jerk for going after my ex for 10 years of child support? My ex left me for someone else when my kids were young, five and two. He paid child support until he was medically released from the military in late 2011. Since then, he hasn't paid me a penny. Anytime I've requested help, like $10 for school supplies, he tells me he has no money. He's always begged me not to file through the state and apologized for not paying. 
Of course, he always promises that he'll start paying at some point. He gets about $2,000 a month from the VA, but his work history has been spotty at best. His parents have helped with his bills. He's actually had a good job for the last two plus years now, but still can't help. I've given him all required visitation, plus extra. I want my kids to be able to have a relationship with their dad. Recently, he had words with my husband, and my ex said that he doesn't owe anything, morally or legally. He said I should file through the state so they can tell me to my face he doesn't owe. His words. I talked to my kids, who are now 19 and 16, and got their go-ahead and filed. The state will be pursuing about $70,000 in back support plus current support for the 16-year-old. I know it's a lot of money, and between him and his current significant other, they have quite a few kids living with them. This will put a huge financial strain on them. So, am I the jerk? Someone suggested I should add this comment as an edit, so here it is. Thank you to everyone for your feedback. To clarify a couple of things, the reason I didn't pursue support before was twofold. One, working sporadically, he didn't have much money. The second and most important reason was that if I had, my kids would have been drug into it. They would have been made to feel guilty for everything they had. My ex and his family would have told them that I was being greedy and didn't really need the money, and so now their dad and his household were doing without because of us. I didn't want my kids involved in that drama, so I just worked more to make it happen. My manager embarrassed me in front of my tables. I work for a chain restaurant in the Northeast. It's a business casual restaurant that you'd all know. The most expensive dish is $35. I've been there five years and I'm a good server. Admittedly, I'm really bad at opening wine and I always have the bartender start it for me. I know it's a no-no, but we are not serving any bottles over $25. We rarely sell whole bottles and I'm not the only server who does this. I'd prefer having the bartender uncork it halfway rather than risk breaking the cork table side. I always make a joke out of it and no table has ever cared. Tonight, one of my managers saw the bartender start opening the wine and she promptly came over and started scolding me, going on about how there's an art to presenting wine and how a wine connoisseur would be livid. This would be fine, except A, it was a $20 bottle of wine at a chain restaurant and B, she did this in front of all of my tables. Then I go to the table Explained that I had the bartender started because I'm miserable at opening wine, to which they laughed and crack a joke. As I'm pouring them their glasses, this same manager screams from across the room, You only have to pour them a taste, not a whole glass! At this point, both my table and I are embarrassed. I understand that I was doing something wrong. I've been there five years. I know that I was breaking a rule. But she did not have to embarrass me in front of my entire section. It's not fine dining, and I'm over it. Ugh. Edit. Thank you guys for such a huge response. I'm still incredibly frustrated and I'm now in the process of looking for another restaurant. I realize that she's the fool in this situation, not me. Ironically, my dad used to own a wine store and he offered to teach me the coveted art that my manager is so hooked on. Before I head to a new job, I'll be sure to learn how to open a bottle of wine. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.